To the Safety Doc Podcast with author, radio host, and nationally recognized safety expert, Dr. David Perodi. Join us each week as we discuss the best and most bizarre practices in safety preparation and crisis response. Follow Dr. Perodin on Twitter at SafetyPhD. And remember, the truth will keep you safe. Hey, everybody, this is your good friend, Dr. David Proden from down here in the infamous North Star Recording Studio. Wishing you well here on this December 19th. Um, Some news from down here is we are um, in store for what could be the biggest snowstorm slash blizzard in probably five years. Might even be longer than that. Um, But yeah, what they are predicting for us is snowfall anywhere um, up to a foot. And granted, it would be light snow because right now it's only 14 degrees and it's going to continually drop through the next few days. Um, So that's light snow. Um, But the problem is that it will be accompanied by 50 mile per hour. Yes, all pro 1110, you heard me right. 50 mile per hour winds. Uh, so that will make, uh, you know, drifting, whiteout conditions, and then salt doesn't work on the roads um, when it gets this cold out. So we could be in for some really treacherous weather. So, yeah, we are, um, you know, hopefully we've got a little bit of traveling to do here over uh, Christmas that that will be OK. But we've already notified people today that as far as, uh, you know, the the weekend coming up. We're going to have to just see what happens because obviously um, the blowing and drifting is very dangerous here. Um, and I was in a, a vehicle accident where my vehicles totaled out um, in January of 2019 um, on some rapidly changing road conditions. And that was during the day. So uh, we'll just have to see what happens. But we're certainly in store Thursday and Friday for some pretty wicked weather. We have do, we have snow on the ground. So this will... Uh, this will be something. Um, I do have plenty of firewood now. I actually contacted my firewood uh, guy today, and I said, hey, like, if we need more toward the end of the season, do you have any more? Because he said, we usually keep a few cords back. But he, he said, I'm sold out. Like, people are buying. Get this. Get this, Mike McClune. People are buying a face cord, not a full cord, a face cord of firewood for $300 cash. Again, we live close to Madison, so people down there kind of scrambling. Energy prices are up, you know, blackouts and all of that. But uh, typically, a cord of firewood would be a base cord would be anywhere from one to hundred to one hundred thirty dollars, depending on what you're getting. Red oak, oak, you know, it burns longer. If it's locust, probably a little bit less delivered. And now, um, and this is across the board. I spent time on Craigslist today, just checking out in my area. Five hundred bucks delivered for a full cord of like a locust and oak mix, which is crazy. And there's not a lot of people are like, they're sold out. So like I said, I'm in good shape now. I've got, uh, I've been burning through quite a bit, but I did go a little heavier on my firewood. Um, But I definitely next year, I'm going to pick up probably two additional cords and I'll keep those outside on the new cement slab, right? And, And burn through those first. But, uh, um, it, it is crazy. It is, it's crazy. Um, so yeah, bitterly cold. So our wind chills here in Southern Wisconsin could be minus 30, uh, for the weekend. So not that this is totally unusual. Like I said, we had a stretch in 2018 or 19. I think we had a stretch in February of 10 days where the high was like, the high was like minus 20 and the city put on their website and, and gave a flyer to everybody and they said just let your water run let it trickle because like water means are breaking and we won't charge you anymore 
And they also said, like, if a power pole goes down, we can't drill a hole. The ground's too, too hard. So we'll just have to like shimmy something up. But, uh, so, you know, the thing is though, it's all, it's the travel stuff. So I'm going to, uh, do some shopping tomorrow, get some extra supplies here and, uh, you know, we'll be okay. Um, but it is, yeah, it is kind of intense. Does that qualify as price gouging? You know, I don't think so, right? Because it's private market is the firewood stuff and it's completely supply and demand. Um, it was interesting though, Corey, because firewood after the start of the pandemic in, you know, spring of 2020, firewood was dirt cheap. Like you could pick up, um, a, f- a full uh, so full cord is three face cord. You could pick up a full cord of firewood for a hundred, hundred twenty bucks delivered. People are doing anything for money, but now it's it's changed because I think people have a, a our energy prices have gone up here 15, 20 percent. And then I think people have a fear of blackouts, right? So if you do have the ability to heat with wood, they're doubling down. Um, and like he said, it's just, it's what the market is. Um, and we also, I guess, are competing against the Madison area. So you might have people, and he was telling me this, you know, in the past, like you might have someone that has a two, $3 million house. And so they were already paying a premium for firewood. They would pay these guys to come in and deliver it and stack it. So, you know, for them, if you're going to, um, double the cost or triple the cost of that, that's not a big thing for them. They don't care. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I'm in pretty good shape. I do have, um, I do have what I call burners or just complete round pieces of wood from a tree still in my basement. And those I'll, I'll be burning here in the next week. Those will burn for a long time, but, uh, lesson learned. I did, I did go a little heavy on the firewood this year. I don't regret it, but I am going to go even, even heavier. Um, so yeah. Um, so <laughs> that's kind of where we're at here at safety dock land. Um, you know, it's kind of, you know, my, the schools will all be closed, um, because Friday they don't have schools. So they're not Thursday. I don't know. We'll see what they do. Um, Thursday, it's not supposed to hit until a little bit later. So we'll see if they run, if they run school or not. But, uh, yeah, I'm not going to drive, you know, that's a thing. Uh, it's one thing if you have snow, but, uh, the, the stuff that goes across the road when it's zero degrees out that slicks over even with an all-wheel drive, just not safe. So, um, but everything, you know, everything will kind of work out well. So, um, hey, a shout out here to Mike McClune. Um, <laughs> he bets his Uncle Ed is regretting moving back to Northwest Indiana. Three to a course, Uncle Ed. Yeah. So I was talking today with one of my clients, you know, because I consult here in Wisconsin, also on the West Coast. It was a warm weather client. And I said, hey, we're in store for some blizzard conditions. And she said, yeah, the weather here is 80 degrees and sunny today. I said, yep. I know. I'm glad you get to enjoy that. So um, Sunflowers is saying, hey, uh, Safety Doc, many years ago in Illinois, we opened up the garage door. All we saw was snow. We couldn't see anything else. My father had to dig a tunnel, uh, walk through it, and have someone pick him up. That's crazy. Sunflowers, when I started working, um, in Wisconsin, I worked toward near Marshfield, which is kind of cent- central northern Wisconsin. We had so much snow. This was the winter of, I don't know, 96, 97. My office was on the first floor, and I looked out across the field. The snow and the drifts were so high, they went above my window and my floor all the way up halfway to second floor on that side of the building. So all I, all I saw was snow. So, and that was crazy. Yeah. All I, all I encountered there was, was snow. So the big thing here and for anybody listening, if you do get into blizzard conditions, one, please, you know, don't drive in those. Um, but check your, your exhaust coming out of your house. We have a direct vent hot water heater. So I need to always make sure in the back of the house, I've got that cleared out right now everything's kind of clear there's just a little bit of snow so but you know things can drift so make sure that you're going out and checking if you're you know where your vents are um around your house and sometimes it makes sense to you know do that with like a plastic shovel in case you hit your siding and stuff you're not marking it all up um 
And then, you know, just, just taking care of getting extra blankets, uh, you know, hand warmers, things like that. And, and the thing is, right, if the power goes out and it's zero degrees outside, well, you instantly have your freezer in mother nature. We have a big screen and porch, which we would just, you know, put stuff out there. Uh, but you know, it's, it's staying, it's, uh, getting the heat, which is the, the issue. So, uh, oh my goodness. Sunflower is saying, um, I haven't got on my winter clothes. I have. So I, I have, and I've got my long johns out. I found those today. I don't wear those often, you know, maybe like 10, 15 days a year, but I've got those ready to go. And then also, um, my heavy lacrosse Iceman winter boots. If those are absolutely needed, those will be ready to go. I have very thick smart wool socks. I actually ordered three more pairs today. Um, the site that it, or the smart wool has changed their socks. Believe it or not, guys, they've changed their socks. So they've gone to, you know, whatever it is now, which is a, a, a new version of their, um, of their smart wall. I'm trying to get myself in the screen a little bit better here. There we go. I think that's pretty good. Um, every time I work with a client, you know, it's different. If I work in Zoom or Google Chat or whatever, or some native platform they have, like I have to re redo. So I'm kind of centered in the screen. So, um, but yeah, it is, I ordered, so I didn't realize they discontinued the PhD socks, which really sucks because they're very well made. I've had pairs for four or five years and they're still in great shape. But I was able to find three pairs from this place, a sporting goods place, like in upper upstate New Jersey. And I contacted them and I'm like, hey, your website says you have these and will you cut me a deal because they're like end of season and well, not, I guess they're not end of season, but they're end of run. And, uh, and so they did. They gave me 15% off and uh, I ordered all three pairs of the large that they had heavy thickness smart wool phd socks which is a special um way that they made these i've had phd socks for like a five years and they're still great so and these are heavy so i don't know if they'll arrive by the time the cold hits but i do have a couple pairs um of wool socks but uh but we're um, we're ready um i typically don't wear like winter boots it's kind of not my thing um i do it instead um I wear um, keen, just hiking shoes. Voyagers is what I wear. I really like those. Um, in winter, if it gets, I mean, if it gets really cold, I have uh, cleats that I put on the bottom of that strap over. So then I'm fine, you know, on an icy pavement and stuff like that. You know, I'm not going to walk and hike with those things, but if I'm cleaning off my driveway, yeah, it's all good. And then um, it's Toy Town and Corey Slater and Sunflowers, Benny Ballistics. Hey, guys. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I typically am fine. Like, my feet rarely get cold. Um, so I've, I've not found a need. But I do have, like, heavy, very heavy-duty lacrosse outdoor boots um, if need be. But typically, I'm, I'm pretty good. Um, and I could always just, for, for the time being, like, wear one pair of socks over another. But... Those smart wool like socks keep you pretty warm, and I've got like heavy choppers. And snow blowing is really difficult in high in blizzard conditions because all the snow blows back. It's so light, it's powdery, so you end up with with that. Um, um, but I do have enough uh, gas for you know to get me through all of this stuff um, and snow blower stuff like that. So. We are all in all in good shape here, so yeah, yeah. So, um, very cool, very cool. Kodiak wool socks. So, um, let's see, let's see what's going on here in the chat, and we'll look we'll going. Andrew, our good friend Andrew, ordered a propane space heater in case the power goes out. Good move, buddy. Yeah, that's my concern here is what would happen if the power went out? You know, I can keep the fire going. I can heat that room. I wouldn't have a blower per se um, in that room. So, but yeah, um, what happens if the power goes out? Those of you who want to support this show in a way other than being here, which I appreciate that. I appreciate you watching the videos, watching the ads, clicking the ads, trying to buy a ballistic belt. Appreciate all of those. 
Um, you can also do a super chat or super sticker. We are about $31 away from the doc actually getting a payout here on December 31st, uh, which would be pretty awesome. My tax person would say, Doc, are you a YouTuber? Are you monetized? You know, Mike McLuhan and I could say yes to all of those things. And Misty, Mrs. Wayne. So, hey, it's Misty, Mrs. Wayne. Hey. So, yeah, we are, um, this is some pretty interesting stuff here with with uh, with the weather going on. Um, but, yeah, I've, uh, I'm going to make sure both of the vehicles are are gassed up tomorrow and, and get some uh, get some reserves here. Um, but I think we're going to be we're going to be in in okay shape. Thankfully, like in our town, all the wires are underground. I know that doesn't mean you can't have a blackout, but um, you know power outage. But um, you know we definitely with 50 mile an hour winds, right? That would be that would really be something. So, oh my god. <laughs> Oh my God, Mike McLoon. Thank you, Mike McLoon. All right, Mike McLoon. Everybody, our good friend, Mike McLoon. That was a really generous thing to do, Mike. I appreciate that. That is awesome. A $20 super sticker from Mike. He has no question with it. No comment, no nothing. He's just like, I am Mike McLoon. And gosh darn it, I am going to do this. Mike has been a supporter in the past of the show with super stickers. Um, and wow, Mike, that is really cool. That is really cool. Uh, we are down to eleven dollars. Uh, so yeah, that is. I mean, I'm not doing. I'm really, guys. I'm not doing this to to say like give Doc money. I, I'm really just kind of like I start the channel. We've been doing kind of and the ad revenue. You guys have been great. And I'm like, will I get to? the threshold of payout and then my tax person who she's awesome. And I can say, uh, yeah, I, I am monetized now, but Mike McLoon, thank you very much. Very much appreciate it, buddy. I, I don't have the interface up that I can do the, the confetti rockets and all that, that, uh, <laughs> that I had to shut that off today because it was on when I was uh, consulting and um, I, I didn't, do it. I wasn't doing confetti when I was consulting stuff like that, but I, uh, I had to turn it off, but then now I, I, I don't think I can turn it on like midstream. So it's kind of a quirky thing, but anyway, here, shh, Oh my God. But we have to do this. I'm going to turn, this is an honor of you turning coop sign on. So, uh, thank you. I'm going to give you a vote for Pedro. Hello, Mike McClune. Thank you, you gosh darn generous savings and loan from Bedford. Whoa, it's a wonderful life, Mike McClune. Look at that. You got that from this guy here. Vote for Pedro. Wow. Mike is coming to play tonight. Mike is like, we are going, we are taking this podcast to the Super Bowl. So Mike comes in as a manager. He's like, we are Super Bowl. There's this, this is not a rebuilding season. The Penguins back there, for goodness sake, says Mike. This is the year. So immediately that's Mike's talk. This isn't a building year. We're, we're not trying to draft our way to success. This is it. Right now. Ronaldo. Mike McLuhan. He is the he, he's the hero. Now, Kentucky Batman, you are the hero. So we're we're not trying to level up heroes. Both of you guys are heroes. But the Kentucky Batman flies a sleigh pulled by bats in Kentucky to give a bonus to the children there, all kinds of toys and stuff. So, uh, yes, the Kentucky Batman flies back in his cave. And the uh, the toys are made by bats instead of elves. So the quality is actually better. Um, a bat does, does a really good job uh, with fine detail. So look at this, you guys. Wow. All right. Thank you for the 14 thumbs up. I appreciate it, everybody. Um, so it is the Kentucky Batman was here. And then the, the Kentucky Batman. Whoa. Hey, Vanessa. Hope you well. We are under a blizzard um, watch, but it's likely to become a warning, which would be our first blizzard here in um, at least five years. 
and 50 mile an hour winds, uh, a lot of snow, minus 30 wind chill. So all the makings of a full on blizzard. I just have to make sure I take the flag in before this hits because the pole will snap in half. I've lost a lot of flags in winter due to high wind, <laughs> high winds that get really brittle. But this makes me extra happy that I took the time to get the snow off of my landscape bushes. And I also spent time yesterday on our big spruce in the back, our 50-foot spruce. I spent a couple hours knocking the, the snow off the lower limbs with a broom, taking my time to do that. And I also spread ash, firewood ash, underneath. And my thought was that then anything that was dipping down was unlikely to stick into the ash um, versus like if it was just the snow. I don't know if there's any logic to that whatsoever, but that was kind of my thinking was to do that. I'm really glad that I could do that. So, but uh, wow. Merry Christmas. Thank you, Mike McLuhan. Very generous. Thank you. Very much appreciate it. Um, so one of the things I did today, which was, I don't know if it's a little bit out of character for me, but a character, right? But um, I contact, I, I changed my consulting structure. So it doesn't have, have any negative impact on the show you know, whatsoever. But um, remember when I started to con do my consulting in 2020, Wisconsin and California, I just kind of focus on those two states. They're really big and California is bigger, but you know, all the, I, I don't have any capacity to go beyond that. So I kind of like to keep my, and the reason I do that is there's different time zones, right? So California is two hours uh, behind in time zones. So right now it's 628 in California. So consulting you, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do consulting in the same time zone, like with multiple states. It makes sense to either do it like with East Coast or out at, you know, Pacific time. So um, I contacted my uh, some of my clients today and I said, because they immediately, I knew this was going to happen. I knew this was going to happen when I started things back up. They said, can you can you give us more time? And I'm like, I don't know. You know, I want to I want to keep my schedule kind of free and I've got certain things I have to do. I'm teaching a class. I got some university hours, you know, I've got to keep free in the schedule and stuff like that. And, and, uh, but I contacted them today. And I'll tell you guys before we get started here with our, with, with the real topic of the show, right? I just, I think the economy is really in bad shape and I think it's, it's significantly deteriorating. When I learned today that my wood, the, the fireplace guy who's, you know, I bought firewood for, for 15 years. This is a great guy, right? You know, and, and out of town, he's got his property. He's got a firewood. He said, Dave, prices have tripled, tripled in 60 days. People are paying cash. I think that is a sign of very dire economic times, right? I just think it's one of those indicators. Like he's like, I've never seen it like this. And the guy is like 60 years old. And so I can't, this afternoon I contacted um, you know, one of my clients and I said, I will, I will add 10 to 12 hours a week to my consulting for you. Um, are you interested? And they said, yes. Um, so I sent them my schedule and I said, it kind of has to be within this range. And oddly enough, I have Tuesdays. I have nothing booked on Tuesdays. I try to do one day off. I usually do Fridays, but, but Fridays got booked up right away. So I kept Tuesdays free. So I'm going to try to keep my Tuesday free, which isn't great, but having a day during the week free is really important because I do get my university teaching, need to be available for university hours, stuff like that, whatever. But um, but I contacted one of my clients, my, my biggest client, and I said, listen, I can give you 10 to 12 more hours a week. Um, if you want it, it's yours. And, uh, and they said, yeah, we'll take it and we'll let you know in the next week or two, really, you know, week or two, like how we're going to do that. I said, here's my schedule, figure out where you want, you know, where you want to book in times and stuff like that. Normally I wouldn't have done that. Like that really locks me in pretty tight because when I consider Pacific time, you know, that's 7.30 to 5.36 o'clock here, four days a week, right? Now, granted, I'm not driving or anything like that, but, but the reason I'm doing it is, you know, you gotta, you gotta make hay when you can make hay. I just think things are so sketchy right now. And some of my investments, oh my God, you know, like I'm very conservative in most things, but you know, just, you know, look at Microsoft and just look at any of those stocks. Like they're just been hammered and down and, and I'm like, I've, I don't know, man. 
So anyway, um, I kind of vowed I wouldn't do that, but I'm going to to do that, I said today. Um, and of course, I do a great job. Da, da, da. But so I think Aaron Clary, uh, or I think I heard Aaron Clary to look at the exchange rate for that doc, exchange rate for, for uh, wood. Yeah, it's a good indicator. And again, this guy is great. Like he's... You know, he's not going to rip me off or anything. I, I know him well, and, and, you know, we talk throughout the year and stuff like that, but he's just like, and of course, like he said, I'll take care of you. Like, I'll get you the firewood. But I already told him today, I said, set me up next year for two more cords than what I normally order, like right off the bat. Just set me up and, and, uh, and, but I'm, I'm just, I'm, it's a really big indicator because you would think that firewood actually would be cheap right now. You'd think that people would be cutting down, you know, dead trees and saying it's seasoned wood and just moving it really cheap to get the money. But that's not the case. The demand is really there. The demand is there because of fear. People are fearing in the short term, utility prices went up. So if they have, you know, the fireplace or wood insert, they're going to use that. They're fearing power outage. In the long term, they're fearing that new construction will have fireplaces banned, like New York, Washington State, places like that. So all these things are a confluence. But the fact, as he said, in 60 days, people bought out all of his reserves. Like he has a shed, a huge shed full of this stuff. And, you know, he normally would sell stuff again for maybe a hundred and thirty, you know, dollars, hundred and 50 per depending face cord you know, red you, you look i mean red oak white oak burns you get more btus out of that than locust or whatever and people be like boom i'll give you 500 for it so um sunflowers the price of gas has gotten significantly low, lower in illinois i think i'll fill up my tank tomorrow yeah price of gas has also dropped here so it's one of those things that's it, I, that is really this misleading indicator of how the economy is doing right well one is i think demand for gas has dropped off um, but look at what you're paying for eggs. Look at what you're paying for your elect electricity. Look at your insurance on your car in your house. My property taxes went up 11%, which was significant for me. That was a lot of money. I had to write that check out this week. Um, so, you know, these indicators where someone's like, you know, gas is down a dollar or two at the pump. Yeah. You know, how long? I don't know. Um, and yeah, take advantage of it. But boy, if we walk into a grocery store, that certainly doesn't translate um, into that whatsoever. So um, I just said, I, I really think, uh, I just, I really think we are in store and not to be a Debbie Downer, that's not the goal, but um, I really, th I believe 2023 is going to be worse financially than 2020. Um and as far as that worse than 2008, 2009, 2001, I think this is, this will be the worst in, in my lifetime. I honest, I honestly believe that. You know, I saw tonight on, uh, on ABC News first here, Mike McLuhan, any time zone is good. Just do it with the daylight savings time. Yeah, I'm, I'm with you on that. I'm not a, I'm not a fan of that. I can't wait till the only thing that makes me happy is the day that it ends in March, but otherwise, yeah getting dark here at 420 in the afternoon is not awesome. Um, I'm with you, Mike. Um, so yeah. So everybody, you know, just, just do what you can, you know, kind of be conservative and look for things. And, and uh, even our goodwill is priced things up a little bit. So, you know, like a dress shirt, seven, eight, nine dollars. It used to be like four bucks a year ago, like literally a year ago. This it's just, it's rippling everywhere so g23 not a fan of daylight savings time you know in wisconsin you really get battered with that because of cold weather you know tips in with that so i think the shortest day of the year is the 22nd right the solstice so as far as like the the light so you know um terrence pop yeah in michigan so he's a he's going to enjoy all the the blizzard weather that's coming over there too. Mike is saying, if the wood is standing, it's better to not cut it down when you drop it. You need to buck it and otherwise it can freeze. So good, good. Yeah. Um, I'm, I'm with you. So thankfully the stuff I, and I do, 
like I said, I have a few burners. I, I really kick myself for, it was two months ago, uh, a neighbor a couple houses down was having a tree move, cut down in the front yard. And I should have just taken my wheelbarrow there and said, Do you, would you mind cutting up some burners when you're cutting these this down and just throw them in a wheelbarrow and I'll take care of them. Burn, what I'm talking about burner is like 16 inches long, eight to 10 inches in diameter and just throw it in there. Like I'll come back and I'll haul it to my house. Right. And then, um, and yeah, I really re regret that I didn't do it. Cause I'm sure they would have said, sure, like no problem. Um, and even if they would have said, oh yeah, like, but you're going to owe us like 20 bucks or something. I'd be like, here's 20 bucks. Um, so, but I do have some burners, um, cause burn. So once you get the fire going for, you know, five, six, seven hours, you can throw a burner in and the fire's hot enough to just consume that. And it's kind of slows it down. But, um, Man, I don't know. I don't know. Um, man against the masses. I paid two seventy two. So, yeah, this is one of those things. So, my stock advisor, um, which that's coming to an end in January. <laughs> I got like two weeks left. I got to deal with that. But um, I remember in April we were meeting, and he's like, "Oh man, like gas is going to you know, one hundred and fifty, two hundred a barrel, and gas will be ten dollars a gallon." I'm like, "I don't, I don't think so, man." At least in, right now, like with this cycle, I don't see it. I see gas like getting high, but then like things waning off. Like, right, the economy is going to like drive things down. And, you know, I don't know all the levers that manipulate gas, but I mean, I just don't see it. So egg price of eggs, right, Vanessa? So the real economy of when you're going in and buying stuff, even soda, I mean, the, you know, uh, six pack of Mountain Dew and Pepsi, right? A bag of Doritos for five bucks. I mean, these things are crazy. So shelf yesterday, no cat litter at the grocery store. Yeah. So we have three cats and I always keep three 50 pound bags in reserve. Always. Um, in case we do, you know, get a run on cat litter that I can get us through. Um one bag will usually last us about two weeks, but I always keep three bags in my firewood room, three bags of cat litter. Um, so, yeah, our Aldi's is busy as heck. Um, I have to get some AA batteries, too. So let me do that right now, guys. Let me put this on because I'm not going to remember it otherwise. And uh, so let me see here. I, what I what I do now is I go into my Samsung Notes, and I put in my uh, my shopping list. And actually, that, it works great. Like it's really because then I can think in the moment and what do I have to add here? Batteries. Um, I've been buying myself beef jerky. It's a little treat for my consulting. So, <laughs> like I'm putting in the time. I'm gonna get some beef jerky. All hail the Harris administration. It's rough times. It's rough times, guys, but stay, stay focused, stay focused. But I, I, to be honest with you, like I said, I, I expect it between now and the election in 2024, just to be, just to be the roller coaster that's had entropy. Nobody's maintained it. You have no speed adjustment on it and it's just going to go bad. Um, that's what I expect. So yeah. Um, oil, oil dry is the same as uh litter here, but a little dust here. So yeah, I do have, uh, actually I do have a bag of oil dry out in the garage, which I could push into reserve if, if I had to do so. Um, specialty boutiques, downtown hardware store, too far to walk, especially boutiques. So this is one thing. So tonight on ABC news. So David Muir, you know, what is it once a week does made in America. And then they highlight some company, you know, some company or some business, right? And it's like, you know, this business is doing whatever and they have eight employees. And I don't know about you, but here's my reaction. When I watch that, I'm like, you know, it's usually soap, cards, jellies and jams. Um, or like, you know, someone who's making a Made in America t-shirt that sells for like $100. So I'm like, none of this is really an industry. No one has started a business that employs like a thousand people and actually makes, you know, like it's cards and crafts is basically what it is. Like this company here in, you know, Eastern Oregon, uh, this family owned company and employ three people, they make custom soaps in these molds of, you know, like birds and you can order them and they ship them around the world. I'm like, well, that's interesting, right? But that's not really, 
to say that's a made in America and you know that's a that's a whole piece here. Like, dude, that's that's not the deal. I want to find the business that's making you know like trailers or something like that that you can, you know, you know, utility trailers. You're, you put buying cars or something like that or w- whatever it is. Like, but they're they're welding it. They're they're making it. They're selling it here. Um, because otherwise all this stuff is basically just stuff I could get at a farmer's market. So I just think it's really, a, a, a the piece is, uh, is tone deaf. I think it's, it's horrible when they do that. And they did it tonight, ABC news again, you know, it's like, Hey, you know, here's a business, you know, and they, you know, they make a custom hand lotion and they got two people working for them. And I'm like, dude, like the economy is horrible. It's getting worse. Like, tell me about somebody who is, you know, manufacturing whatever, X, Y, Z, right, to help people out. Like, his company is forging, you know, out of burnt or melted down railroad ties, these heavy-duty shovels so people can, you know, do gardening. And I'm like, well, that's cool. Like, I get that and get into that. I don't know. Not a big fan of that. So, Mike is like, look at this. Gas in PA, 373 a gallon. Your gas has been low. It's been under three dollars here. I don't drive a lot. <laughs> like I said, I I literally will have to fill my car up once a month, like if that. And I know I have to like burn the gas through, so I gotta kind of find trips to take. Like, oh, I gotta I gotta drive here to like, you know, get something. Um, drive to Menards in the town over or something like that. So um, gas is really kind of a, a non factor directly, although it's indirectly a factor, you know, for the cost that we get charged. But thankfully I'm not commuting anywhere. I commute down here to this, this office, which is really a luxury to be able as much as, you know, I look at my schedule for consulting some days and I'm like, Oh God, you know, seven thirty to five at night or something. And like, that's a lot of meetings to have. It's a lot to keep track of. There's a lot of prep, but I'm like, when I'm done, I'm walking upstairs. I'm not getting in the car. I'm not having to fight traffic for an hour, put myself at risk. Um, I'm not having to go to some meeting where we're talking about, oh, like, let's talk about the culture here. <laughs> I'm like, I'm the only guy doing the culture, and culture is pretty good here in the Safety Doc Studio. So um, I'm just thankful, honestly, that I have this opportunity. And I'm so thankful, guys, if you ever leave a job that there's any remote chance that you might go back to, leave on good terms. Now, when I left my clients, it was really great terms, right? They were sad, and I think they were nervous because they're like, well, Dave knows what he's doing. He knows, you know, special ed law and all this stuff. And I'm like, yeah, you got it. Um, you know, you'll be all right. There's somebody out there. If I'm not here, there's there's a, somebody else. Um, but, you know, really left on good terms. Been great to work with you. Got everything buttoned up. You know, if there's anything after the fact, get a hold of me. It's not like I'm going to bill you extra if you find something. Um and, and then, so when I returned, right, you know, it was an easy return because they're like, oh, we liked working with that guy. We left on good, you know, left on good terms. And plus I left to write a book and do a book tour. So, I mean, it's a pretty good excuse, you know, I mean, it's a, it's a real excuse. It's authentic. It's not just say, oh, I got, I got burned out and I needed a year off, which was not the fact, you know, I was actually doing all the book stuff and I had my time deadlines, stuff like that. And was narrating and, but, um, uh, but let me get through here. Food dehydrator. I had a food dehydrator that started on fire when I lived in an apartment in Stevens Point. It started on fire, and I got, I got to it just in time. Um, but, yeah, I was on the counter. Food dehydrator started on fire. Cora, Cora is a bad experience. It's kind of rude me for life. Uh, jerky. So, yeah, I'm a big fan of Worcestershire sauce and salt. Picked up sodas are good for Mike McLuhan for... This Saturday paid seven bucks per 12 pack of Coke. Yeah, Coca-Cola and Coca-Cola as a stock has done really well. One of those stocks I brought up to my invest, my stock advisor. And I said, hey, like Coke seems like a pretty good stock two years ago. And he's like, yeah, no, it's all kind of seasonal. I'm like, yeah, but it pays a dividend. Anyway, um, 30 pack of PBRs. So holy smokes, you guys. Paps Blue Ribbon. So, um, Joe Morris in the house. A sixer of Nagra Madella was my treat beer for Monday. So Dragon's Milk Stout and Delirium Noctorium. So guys, I did do the, uh, remember I was, before we get into the, today's show, which I say 40 minutes in, 
I uh, I got my CB, not my CBD. I got my Delta H gummy order on uh, Tuesday, and uh, and it was potent. So uh, I was gonna do like a show on it and everything like that, but uh, but wow, like it was, it kind of threw me for a loop. So very effective. Um, and I I bought the higher dose right off the bat instead of like coming in at the normal dose <laughs> level. And, uh, and I was, I was pretty floored for, um, you know, and I was, I was at home, but for maybe eight to 10 hours. So it was pretty crazy stuff, man. Pretty crazy stuff. So eight to 10 hours. So I think it's very, you know, it's potent. I, now I kind of know what it does. I would start out, you know, with maybe a third of it, but uh, because it, it goes through your digestive system. So it's, it's really, there were, here's some things I noticed about it. One, when I watch stuff on YouTube or on the news, it seemed like I had already seen it, even though it was real time. And like, I was predicting what was going to happen. It was just a really weird thing. Like, but I, everything was like, I was like, it already had happened. Um, and I had this previous knowledge that was one effect. And then, um, and then the, the other effect was just kind of this, this strange proprioception of kind of like what's around you. It wasn't like a stumbling or stuff like that, but it was just, um, but I was like, whoa, anyway, um, Andrew's saying the high price of soda proves they can't make the formula cheaper. Maybe it's a good thing. So Mike is saying, you usually don't keep soda at the house, but we were having company on Saturday and Christmas Eve. So I admit in summer, I don't really drink soda. I drink just water and tea, like iced tea, but not like calorie iced tea, just like tea that's cold. Um, in winter, I will drink usually one soda a day, either Mountain Dew or Pepsi. I know I shouldn't, but you know, it's, it's just kind of the way it is here in Wisconsin. It's the agorizer. I've never left a position in a way that I couldn't go back. And I've returned to jobs twice. Yeah. I'm so glad. I didn't really have any reason to do any of that with, uh, you know, with this situation. But uh, I've known people who have burned the bridge. You know, they've they've gone down into the uh, river then and just, you know, disbanded any pieces remaining of the bridge. <laughs> They've salted the earth so nothing grows. I mean, I've known people who've done that. I'm like, whoa. Um, but yeah, you know, this was this was all good. And I let people know plenty of time in advance and transitioned them out. But uh, but when they were ready to get back, um, it was an easy, you know, the relationship is the big thing. If they trust you, um, you know, that you do a good job for them, they like working with you. Whoa, Doc, I got one of those magic gummies gives you psychic powers for a few years. I do have nine left. I used one. I have nine left. Um, so it's something I think I would use if I was having like a migraine headache um, or I was like really achy. Um, I wouldn't use it kind of on a recreational basis. Um, but I, w I was very like coherent, you know, throughout the whole process. But it was a really strange thing, Joe, was I was able to see that uh, I was able to watch things or I watched things and it seemed like I had already watched them, but it was like, Oh, just released 11 minutes ago. Dan from I allegedly. And I'm like, I watched him like, Oh, I already saw this. And it's like, well, I didn't know. I didn't see that. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I, I, I was really looking into that for the, the ability to kind of mitigate migraines or, you know, if there was kind of severe, not severe, but more intense fatigue to kind of get through that. But uh, so I, anyway, I was, I was satisfied. It certainly did have an impact because it's, it, it takes about two hours for it to start to have an impact when you do a, a gummy, just to know that. And then I was kind of like, when will, when will this end? And it, yeah, it's about eight to 10 hours. G23, I've torched the bridge with a company because I had to sue them for paying overtime. Well, in that case, bring out that torch, buddy. Yeah, there are, there are instances where I knew I wasn't coming back and things were in a very bad state. <laughs> I wouldn't say I torched it, but it was very clear of saying, I'm out of here. You know, you run into these things of uh, non-disclosure agreements and you don't want anyone to, you don't want to publicly say anything bad about anyone because you don't want to be sued. But, uh, 
but I've, I've pretty, in some instances, I made it clear as I'm exiting, I will not be back in these parts ever again. I'm talking about that. We have a show starting here at the 45 minute mark. So look at Alpha's Burn Bridges. So failure isn't an option. It's Andrew. Yeah. Well, I think if there's people, if I'm in an, if I'm in a client relationship, right, that I'm consulting and I don't think it's working out or, you know, I feel that I'm not being, I don't know, respected because I, I can take anybody, right? I mean, there's a long list of people that there's a, you know, that would do this for the specialty area that I have special education law in those areas. So, um, I would just discontinue it. I, I, I wouldn't do it. It's kind of like Chad Elkins. Like I would pick and choose my clients, which I, which I did now. Like, you know, I think I have the best clients out there. So they're great to work with. Um, but uh, so we have guys, dun, 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 opioid emergencies in K-12 schools. So I, wa I want to talk about this because um, I think what, is what's happening very quickly in schools across the nation, not only Los Angeles, yeah, Los Angeles is a big profile, but schools are putting Narcan or Noxalone, which is generic Narcan in like the cabinet where the AED is, they're saying, here it is, and use it if you have to. They're doing some training, but otherwise they're not. And we're gonna get into this right now of, of what this looks like, um, the arguments that are coming up for and against this. It's a case study I'm actually going to use in one of my classes. But uh, let me let me start us out. On September 7th, 2022, Wisconsin Senator Tammy Baldwin introduced Bill 4794, Naloxone, which is generic Narcan, Education and Access. The bill reauthorizes through fiscal year 2020. 27, so meaning if it passed, it'd be funded through 2027, expands eligibility for and otherwise makes changes to a grant program that supports access to medications that reverse opioid overdoses. Example, naloxone. What might this mean for K-12 schools? So um, before I get into the numbers, Narcan's um, generic Narcan naloxone is pretty cheap. It's like $25 a dose. And that's even now with the, with the supply chain. The issue is you might not be able to get it or not. So, um, but it is pretty, it relatively is pretty cheap. It's about $25. So, um, it's a Kentucky Batman. Do we need to fight the snowstorm off? If you could, if you could move it just a little south of my area, Batman, I would appreciate that. Make sure it's not sticking around on Saturday because it might have to do a little traveling. That depends. It's our good friend, Bacon. So, Bacon. Um, opioid use data, according to 2017 final report of the President's Commission. This is one of those weird things where I have to start quoting back to stuff before the pandemic because during the pandemic, all of the data just looks garbage. So, and I think it'll be that way for a few years. So you're quoting any data like, oh, on air travel, on this or whatever. Like, you can't quote 2020 and 21 because it's all messed up. So, anyway, um, According to the President's Commission on Combating Drug Addiction and Opioid Crisis, in 2016, an estimated 239,000 adolescents aged 12 to 17 were current misusers of pain relievers. Um, and then it goes on. But anyway, it's saying um, the use of, um, what, oxycodone, heroin, morphine, you know, these, these different opioid classes. And, of course, now fentanyl is a big um, concern. So opioids have been increasing in schools. Um, the, you know, presence of opioids, opioid overdoses. So, and there's also the issue now with fentanyl that not only at a playground at a school, right? Um, you know, it's not that you have a first person user who's, who's doing that. You're probably not having a second grader who's using opioids, but you could have a second grader in a playground and on the weekend, that's where people are gathering to exchange fentanyl or whatever. And there's fentanyl on a swing set. And suddenly a kid is makes contact with that. And now, you know, they have a reaction to fentanyl. And these things are happening. So the Los Angeles uh, Unified School District became the latest to do so. Last month, they, they made a standing order for naloxone. 
They would stock the drug. They would train qualified staff to use it. I don't know who's qualified staff. I think that gets tricky. Um, and it was part of their thing of saying, we are going to reduce this epidemic of overdoses. Other districts in Des Moines, Iowa, and Denver have also done this. They've stocked naloxone. So I think here's one thing right off the bat. If you're saying we're going to do this, we're going to train qualified staff. Who's qualified? It's like, we're going to train qualified staff to use the AAD. Well, that doesn't make sense. Like you're going to train either everybody to use AAD or else the AAD is self-explanatory. Like, the, you know, um, fire extinguisher in a hallway, whatever. Like some of these things have to be kind of universal. So I I don't like this term here, qualified staff, but I kind of get it. So, so let's get into, there's a bill, this bill I just talked about, Senator Tammy Baldwin from Wisconsin. The bill would amend the existing Public Health Services Act. And what it would basically change is instead of saying a pharmacy needs to prescribe naloxone, it would say you can buy naloxone over the counter. So that's really the biggest change. And then it also would extend the Good Samaritan rules to people administering Narcan or naloxone. Same thing, right? Naloxone is generic Narcan. The deal is, though, like that's a state thing. Good Samaritan is state by state. So that's that's a big thing on here. But um, so you'd have to have the states kind of take that up. But uh, so but she's trying to get this federal bill of saying, hey, schools. And it's not only schools. It's like schools, post offices, public ins institutions. It goes to tribes, you know, Native American tribes. If they have a, you know, council meeting building or something like that. Um, so public buildings, right? And I'm like, okay, kind of see where you're going here. So there's a bill, and if this passed, schools would legally have what's called a standing order. Again, a standing order is if it's in the law. So if you were to administer an AED when they first came out, um, you know, the defibrillator, you would have needed to be trained on that and very few people would have had those so you go back to like the tv show emergency which was like mike McLuhan's favorite show but um you know not everyone could just grab an aed and use it so you had to have kind of an order or training to do that and another thing is like an EpiPen. a lot of schools in the last 10 years and a lot of states went to what's called a standing order for an epi pen you can buy an epi pen at a pharmacy without a prescription about 100 bucks but um so the deal here is saying, let's make naloxone and Narcan where you don't need a prescription and anybody can administer it because it's going to save lives. Okay, I get it. I mean, I get that argument. Um, and meaning like then, it, in, you know, you can legally put it in these places, libraries, schools, stuff like that. Okay, I get it. Um, here's some considerations though for schools. Like if you're really thinking about doing this in schools, so this is good. So um, G23, thanks for pointing this out. Yes, AEDs will walk you through the process. They, you know, if you open it up, the cabinet does have pictures. It does have voice that says, put the pads on the person here where there's a little diagram and it flashes, like put them here, you know. And then at the beep, you know, press this button or, you know, it steps you through that. So it's very similar as what they're trying to get to with um, with Narcan. We talked earlier in a different show about um, in Cincinnati, they have vending machines where you can get Narcan and fentanyl testing strips for free. But then there's a number you call, there's like a phone on the side and they get some information from you. But they don't charge you, but they're like, you know, they I guess they ask you a series of questions. They're trying to figure out like who's using these machines. So, so some questions are going to come up. One in the school community, and I'll be working with this in spring in my aspiring school leaders classes. So look at this. It's Ron Wayne. I've been binging emergency. Oh God, I love it. Ron, by the way, there was a 48 hour emergency marathon when I was in college on TV. And I watched all 48 hours, every episode. Um, it was worth it. I, um, but yeah, I watched every episode. Pizza, Mountain Dew, man, whatever it took. It, toward the end, like I was just... I was ready for it to be done, but I love the TV show Emergency, so you know what I'm talking about. Um, so for schools, one is, okay, if you get a federal bill passed saying you can have Narcan available without an order, 
you still have to get like your, you have to know where your state, their position is on that. Now again, Narcan in and of itself isn't other, other than right now it's through a prescription. Um, it's not illegal to own. It's not like having THC or something that'd be a felony drug. You know, no one's going to really steal Narcan, right? And try to resell it or get a high off Narcan. It doesn't work that way. So, but you still have to deal with the state. So that's one thing for the schools is they're going to get pressure because the feds might pass something and then the states, they got to figure out where the states lie on this, right? Because what if, here's a scenario, what if schools start to put Narcan in their AED boxes around campus and then, you know, somebody instead, a student or staff or adult or whatever goes into this Narcan instead of calling 911. You know what I'm saying is they're like, I know that this Narcan is there. So if I overdose, I'll just go there and then it'll reverse it. But then their lawyer could say, yeah, but this, the, the you know, by doing this, really this person should be calling 911. They shouldn't be trying to find the Narcan that's in the school AED box. So like schools need clarity on this. So this is one thing where the feds might come out and pass this and say, we'll fund it. We'll give you your Narcan. We'll give you an allowance for, you know, Narcan again, which is pretty cheap, but, um, but that's an issue. So the other, you know, some other things are perception. Does a school, how, how is the school board going to do this? It's Uke. My gosh, that's Dave loving guy right there. Helping out, making staves for the greater community. It's you. Um, so how does it look to have this from a from just kind of a perception standpoint in your district? Are you saying we have surrendered the efforts to mitigate um, opioids, right? We're, we're now on this of trying to reverse the effects. I'm just saying people will come up and will ask this at board meetings. Um, so you have to have a response that you have to be ready for that. And as a school, not all schools are going to be on board with this. I can tell you that right now that is, they will not all schools will be on board with this. Um, so, you know, the argument I think is going to be, if you have this, then you can, you know, hopefully prevent an overdose death. That person would have more time to get access to services, so during that time frame, hopefully they get connected to services or something. So then they they would change their tra- trajectory and not have another overdose that would take their potentially take their life, right? Um, but school officials are going to ask, like, um, what if? So what's the deal? What if some? What if someone overdoses? They're suspected of overdosing, and it's a high it's a high schooler, and another high schooler runs to the AD cabinet pulls out the Narcan and administers it. So now you have a one 17 year old administering Narcan to another 17 year old. What does that look like legally? Um, and so these are questions that need to be answered, right? Do you just say it has to be an adult and is the adult trained? Or again, it's kind of like, you know, pulling a fire alarm. When I asked my school administrators, I'm like, who has discretion to pull a fire alarm in your school? And they're like, anybody does. I'm like, yeah, but really they don't. If you actually ask people, if you survey them on an anonymous survey, just out to your staff, or you just ask people individually and say, you know, what would you do if there was a fire, right? They would, 81% of people say, I'd find an administrator. So I'm like, so where do you fall on this? Where did things go? And so these are questions that need to be answered. So that's where like this federal bill is going to have a lot of things that have to be follow up with it. So, um, so Vanessa's saying, um, Hey, Vanessa's saying have first aid kits in your vehicle workshop. Yeah, absolutely. Right. And it's amazing too, that we don't require first aid training for a lot of professions. It's not required in schools, at least in my state. Um, I've known a lot of people with opioid addiction. A lot of people have died from it. Yep. I worked with a lady and her son and uh, his wife died while I was working with her a few years ago um, from opioid overdose. So just absolutely, absolutely devastating. Um, first one was a kid. I went to high school. He was a 15 died of overdose in the school bathroom. He was found still alive, but unresponsive, but the school was unequipped to handle the situation. 
So this is the argument coming out of saying, listen, this is happening. So let's get the Narcan, the naloxone in the schools and in the libraries, right? And in the post offices, I guess. But um, but probably libraries and schools are the two biggest, biggest pushes to, you know, where to put these. But right now, you know, we're really talking, the schools, right? Like put these in schools. And do you put them only in high school or are you putting these in elementary? It's unlikely an elementary student might have one, but a staff member, a parent coming in, you know, Somebody using the building after hours? I don't know. By the time the paramedic show up, he was gone. So sad. So sad. Um, don't know if there was Narcan back in 95. Yeah, I don't know if it, or if it was readily available. So right now with this bill, um, Senator Baldwin is saying, listen, let's make it a standing order. And then who knows if it'll say $25, right? The the companies that make the, the naloxone stuff, you know, maybe that'll go up. I don't know. But but right now it's like, it's about 25 bucks. So, um, yeah. So schools are responsible for your children while they're in their care. So, you know, Corey is saying, you know, what's, it's a good point, Corey. Like, you know, I would look at this. So the question would be like, what would doc do about this? And I would say, I would put the naloxone in, uh, in the AD cabinets. The AD cabinets have kind of evolved in a lot of schools to become like the safety cabinet. Like the AD is there. The first aid kit is there. Um, epinephrine, right? An EpiPen is usually there. It's kind of like just morphed into this like area. And that's what I would do. I wouldn't spread these things around like, oh, it's a scavenger hunt. Like the EpiPen's down that hallway and the AD is over here and the first aid kit's over here. Like put it all together. But um, but I would do it. I would do it. Um and yeah, I mean, what, the thing is like, once you do that, you'll never go back. Like there will never be a time when that, when that AED cabinet, you know, eventually, you know, last five, 10 years, then the EpiPen went in it and that will, that will always be there. And now the, the Narcan is in there. That will always be there. So it's one of these things too, of like, you, you can't put the, once a genie's out of the bottle, you're not going to put the genie back in the bottle. So culturally, and you know, it is, this, it's a shift for schools. But right, um, you got to realize this is happening. It's in concert with whatever efforts you're doing. But um, yeah, I would say I would say go for it. You know, um, you know, interesting thing, Mike, with a fire extinguisher, right? It's like I've never I train people on how to use a fire extinguisher. And I was a firefighter, um, but I train people on how to use it in a school setting. I've never I've never been in a school that's brought in firefighters to train people how to use a fire extinguisher, right? Even the fact of like aim at the base and there's always an exit between you and the fire. So your back should be to the exit and you should be facing the fire kind of like at an an angle. Right. But, but uh, like those things are never, never taught. So we have these fire extinguishers and it's just kind of crazy, but um, I have three, Fire extinguishers in my home. And uh, yeah, very good. I've, I think I've got three here. Also got one just around the corner, a bigger one. Um, can probably never have enough of those. Um, I have a couple of friends currently recovering from heroin addiction. This is Joe. My buddy's wife keeps Narcan for him now and showed me where it was. Yep. So, you know, one of the questions here is should Narcan just be a standing order that you can get Narcan or Naloxone, which is the generic Narcan. And it's just over the counter. That's where this federal bill is by Tammy Baldwin. There might be others. I think the answer is yes. You should do, you know, it should pass. For schools, you got to talk to your insurance company. Who do you train? What if a 17-year-old administers Naloxone to another student, right? Are you, what does that look like from a liability insurance? Are you training? Are you telling students? Are you telling high school students? You know, because that's one thing, like high school students rarely get told, oh, you can activate the intruder alarm or the fire alarm. Like they don't think they have the authority to do that. So would you say you have the authority to grab the first aid kit or you have the authority to use AD or naloxone or the EpiPen? So these are things that have to come into handbooks, professional development. Um, they're not there. I can tell you right now, I don't, I don't know of one school where they've overtly said or trained anybody who's a student 
to say you can use an EpiPen. But, you know, right, there could be many situations when that would happen through, you know, times in school or athletic or something, event or, but, you know, is it going to be where someone is going to try to to find a staff member and then try to get that staff member compelled to administer the EpiPen? So these will be, these will be big, big questions. Um, so you're ultimately, as I said with this, um, so this is this is readiness and emergency management, their statement on this. They have a really nice guidance document, um, which I reference in the blog post, which will be out tomorrow. Here's what they say for naloxone in schools. Identify with general counsel and inform the campus community about state Good Samaritan laws that provide immunity from arrest. Now, remember, we talked with Lisa Lenny on the show, Attorney Lisa Lenny. That's not as clear as what you would think. And when is the last time any of us, G23, Andrew, Vanessa, Joe, Mike, when have you ever seen a commercial, a 30-minute public service commercial of, hey, like your state has good Samaritan, or our state has good Samaritan law. So if you see an accident or if you see, you know, somebody joking and do the Heimlich or whatever in the good Samaritan law, like that's nowhere. That not only should be a day, a good Samaritan day, it should be like a, a week or even like a month. We have like allergy month. We have all these different different things, but there should be something where each state reviews their good Samaritan laws and immunity and kind of, and gives examples, right. Of some of that. Um, so that's kind of bothersome. I think that needs to be part of this. So when I see this bill, I, I read through the whole bill. It wasn't very long. I'm like, you know, the problem with this is what Lisa pointed out. If this doesn't couple with like global, first aid training or like some public recognition of, you know, public service of like how the good Samaritan law works. Like people will kind of be like, I'm not sure I'm going to administer Narcan because maybe I'll get sued. What if I do it wrong? You know? Um, Or what if they have a worse reaction? What if they don't come out of it or whatever, you know? So all these people would rather not do that. And there's, there's, that's, that's legitimate thinking unless you've overtly, been educated on like Good Samaritan law and some of those things. So I think there's a piece missing in this. And schools definitely want to nail that Good Samaritan law interpretation down. Um, so, okay. So anyway, this is from the Readiness and Emergency Management from the U.S. government. Identify with general counsel and inform the campus community about state Good Samaritan laws that provide immunity from arrest, charge, or prosecution for certain drug offenses for a person experiencing an overdose or witnessing another person experiencing an overdose who seeks medical attention. What that's really saying is it's between you and your legal counsel for your district. I don't like that. That's the same thing that that politicians do with EpiPens, with first aid, with everything is they're like, okay, you know, like it's up to you on how you're going to interpret this. And I'm like, but that's, you know, that's not legit. You've got to overtly tell people the Good Samaritan law applies to them if they grab Narcan and they believe someone is having an overdose and they administer it, um, you know, that they will not be sued. And that's not part of this. And I'm not saying this is part of these campaigns. That's the part that keeps people on the sidelines. And there's also this part too of like, you know, there should be in Cincinnati, they, in the vending machine, they also have gloves like a higher mill rate glove. So if there is fentanyl on that person, they're, that it's not transferring to you or they have a mask or stuff. But, um, so, so here we are, we, here we are, we are in 2022, the end of 2022, Los Angeles schools, um, Des Moines, Iowa, Denver, to name a few are stocking naloxone in their schools. Anybody, who's trained apparently can use this, but you're not charging you for it. There was a bill by Tammy Baldwin, uh, Senator Baldwin, um, trying to get federal passage of a standing order for naloxone in public places. Uh, also, it extends to Indian reservations. And But um, so you could have naloxone at your post office, at a school, right? At your library, that's most likely where it would be. Um, and then, you know, does, it looks like the feds fund this. How does it get? So are you putting in an order then if you're a library or a school and it gets sent to you? 
And then what do you have to track on that? You know, so this is all fuzzy stuff. Like, you know, I think of those things. I walk around my neighborhood, you know, you probably see these things too. It's like, oh, it's like the, the little red library. It's like the box on a stick. And it's, uh, I, I know there's a better name for this, like the little library house or whatever. And there's like 20 books inside. It's like, take a book and it's yours, you know, and return it if you want or like leave another one. And I'm like, the thing is like, I've never seen anybody really take advantage of that. You know, like I get the idea. Now they've changed those two where it's like, it's not only books, but you know, there's like a couple of cans of soup in there and, you know, some things like that and, you know, some deodorant and stuff like that. So if you need these things, you know, you just, just take them. Um, so is this kind of where we're headed on some of this stuff? I mean, I don't, I don't know. Um, as I said, I think one of the biggest liabilities on this that's not being talked about would be, what if somebody says, I went to the library or the post office or the school to get the naloxone because I was having an overdose or my friend here was having an overdose and that person dies because you're spending this time doing that. And then a lawyer takes on a case and says, you know, you put these things in these places, but you never had a real education campaign and also saying the first thing you should do is call 911. But these people probably don't want to call 911, right? But um, so, you know, what I'm saying is like instead of calling 911, you're telling someone drive 15 minutes over there to the school or the library and get your naloxone. Um, you're, you're kind of subtly telling them that through the way that you're doing this. So, I have a I have a lot to talk about with my aspiring school leaders in the spring semester on this because I think the bill will pass. I think the bill will pass. I think the state where I live, Wisconsin, will be kind of contested on this. I I don't see this as a first time <laughs> breeze through passing type of thing. Um, we'll see where things go, but uh, yeah, I um, what would you do? So let me go over to the chat here. What would you guys do? In your community, if they held a, a forum and they said, hey, you know, Mike and Bacon and Joe and Vanessa, you know, what do you think? Should we put this in the school? Should we put it in the libraries? Would you administer it if you saw someone who you thought was doing an overdose as you're going to the post office to buy stamps? You know, I don't know. What what do you what do you guys think about this? What am I missing? This is Joe. You have a couple of friends currently recovering from heroin. My buddy is what? Got that one before. Sorry about it. Um, this is Yuke. Joe, I've got an ex who was a heroin addict, and it got to the point where I got some Narcan to keep on hand just in case of stupid ODs. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and are we going to have a public service, you know, even like a, a commercial of someone administering Narcan? Would that go too far? I mean, I've seen a lot of commercials that seem to go too far. But would that seem logical? Should that be a part of this? I would say yes. Um, Mike is saying, I have three fire extinguishers in the house, one in the garage. Well, so you have two in the house, one in the garage, but you can never have enough. Um, so never have enough fire extinguishers. Joe, it's pretty messed up. We've been conditioned to not help each other under threat of legal action because sometimes survivors will sue those who helped. Yeah. Yuke, this is right on. Thank you so much for posting this. This is the question that is going to be asked by every school administrator out there. They're going to ask their lawyer and then they're going to, school board is going to ask the lawyer. They're going to, you know, say, Hey, but you know, what if we, what if this happens? And, and before it was, Narcan, before it was Narcan, it was EpiPens. What if we administer an EpiPen to someone who has an allergic reaction to peanuts or shellfish or whatever, right? And, uh, you know, so, or we administer an AED and somebody dies and there's someone who testifies as an expert witness and says, well, the AED actually sent them into dysrhythmia and killed them. <laughs> I mean, or, you know, if you administer, it was all these things too, you know, somebody is pulled from a fiery wreck, right? And then 
you know, they sue the person and say, my spine is messed up because you pulled me from this thing. And you're like, well, the thing was on fire. I thought it could explode. And then there's an expert witness. A witness is brought in from the, the plaintiff, right? And they're saying, well, you know, this this was only burning here and in, in the seats or whatever. And that's not likely to cause an explosion. Well, in the moment, you don't know that, right? You're trying to get this person away. But that's where, when have we seen Vanessa, Ron Wayne, the Kentucky Batman, all you guys, we haven't seen states, and the states are the ones for Good Samaritan. It's not federal, state. We haven't seen states proactively get on their horse on this and do commercials or a Good Samaritan day or week or month and say, listen, yeah, you come over a hill and there's a car flipped over and, you know, you decide to stop and help Good Samaritan law, right, if you are trying to stop, you know, someone bleeding or if the vehicle gets started on fire and you, you get them away from it or, you know, whatever it is or administering an AED or an EpiPen or, um, but that's the part that really floors me on this is we see these bills come out and we don't see anything that comes with, there'll be this education component that's coming out. So, right. Like if I'm a school, if I'm a school administrator in this, I'm like, what's the state doing to educate people about the good Samaritan law? Like who has my staff members back? So if my high school math teacher administers Narcan, they don't have to freak out about being sued a month later. And then are they getting their own legal counsel? Is the school picking that up? Like, how does this work? Like clarify these questions for me. I want to know. So you bring in the school's insurance carrier. Is there like a state bill that provides some, you know, heightened level of a uh, defense on that? So, because otherwise, right, it would just, it wouldn't make any, I mean, you'd have to risk analysis, everything in this litigious society. And you'd have to say, I, I just don't know. I mean, am I, am I opening myself up to all of these things? And I'm saying that can be mitigated if the states would stand up and be overt in their, their good Samaritan laws that are on the books of saying, here's what it is. And I know they don't want to give an example in a commercial. You know, the example most of us would see, you, you come around a corner, someone looks like they've OD'd, there's like a, uh, there's a needle there, right? or you, you've come upon a car accident, whatever it is. Nobody wants to, to deal with that because they're saying, oh, like, but things might not play out that way. We don't want to do an exemplar and have everybody benchmark to it. So, but, uh, man, I don't know. I don't know. I think that's that's a big part that's missing. So schools will will continue to press this as much as they, as much as they can. So, um yeah, yeah. So, um, thank you everybody for supporting the the show. By the way, through watching the ads or being here, we're up to one thousand two hundred fifty eight subscribers. I'd be thr- I'd be thrilled if we got to one thousand two hundred sixty. Um, but I know, you know I can see you know, ad revenue, right? And but it's about recognizing the channel, recognizing. All of us as a community, you know, there'll be a full blog post. I already wrote it. comes out with this. 199 episodes as of tonight. Soon we'll have 200. I'm bringing more guests on the show. So it's really a good scholarly thing when we have so much that is just out there for pure short-term entertainment or just pollution, right? This is, you know, when you guys are in here and what you're sharing, I mean, it shapes a lot of the stuff that I do. You make me a better person, a better university instructor by far. Um, but I think we all work together on something that is contributing to like the scholarly knowledge base, which is really rare these days <laughs> to do that. So I'm just thankful for all of you, Vanessa, you know, you, Mike, um, Andrew. So thank you guys so much. You know, a TikTok ad, Ron has got it. Um, you know, government gets together. Oh, we got TikTok fluencer, influencers, uh, you know, how to get people to wear a mask or something. It's like, get, get it your influencers together and i mean i'm not a big fan of tiktok but tiktok or youtube shorts but have them do something on the good samaritan law i mean people in 30 seconds right you can cut together some awesome stuff but i think we should have a good samaritan day i think all of these bills are um hamstrung unless you pair them to a formal 
Good Samaritan Day, or I would even say week, or I would put that even as a month if you're kind of to do like Good Samaritan. You know, we do allergy month is April. Um, you could do like, uh, I don't know if it would be first aid in Good Samaritan, right? Um, and CPR, I don't know if you roll it all in what that would look like, but into a week or a month, we don't do it. So as these bills get passed, people are short-sighted when they miss out on these things. Because all of you have pointed it out. People measure their responses and they're like, I don't know if I'm going to get in trouble for this. If you're a high schooler and that Narcan is there and someone overdosed, maybe as a teacher that's overdosed, I don't know, in their parking lot, you, you, you can grab that Narcan and get it out there. Um, am I going to get in trouble for this? Do, am, I, am I authorized? Do I have discretion to use this? They don't know. They don't know. You have a substitute staff member. You have a staff member who's new to it. They don't know. So this is the issue. So yes, a standing order that helps. Um, it's not really cross prohibitive. You know, Ebby pens are very, you know, rel- they're four times more expensive. But um, yeah, I'm just if we don't put the two together, the this Good Samaritan part of this, this whole thing falls apart. Um, so. Joe Morris, I miss that. I don't have my ability to do like the cannon of confetti. So keep Narcan in the hands of first responders, security personnel, and school nurses, trained teachers, and men. So, which would be a good a good step because right now, again, it's first responders um, have it. If you moved it to more of a standing order, you could get it. You could get it out there into school buildings. So. Um, you have some people clearly, and I get this, it's a, you feel defeated. You're like, I never thought we'd get to this point. I never thought we'd get to, you know, I guess it's one thing with EpiPens, right? Because, you know, you don't know if you're going to have a food allergy or allergic reaction to, to something, but, but this, you know, this looks like a, this is a societal thing, you know, it looks like where we are acquiescing to something that's just overtaken us in society. I get it. I get where you're coming from on that, but, you know, the reality is you're, you the the data says you're saving lives with this that you are um, objectively saving lives you got to do it and the other stuff has to fall into place i guess the best it can but you, you you've got to do it i would i have a couple things in my spring class i tell people I'm like there's things i'll tell you it's a nike remember nike's logo used to be here the slogan used to be you got it just do it just do it and i'll be like this is a, this is a just do it um You've got to be on the side for getting this in your schools because you have one person that dies because you didn't have Narcan there. That's it's just not a, because culturally we're not a district that you know wants to to give people a sense that you know they can have careless behavior without consequences. I get it, right? People driving fast in cars, other things, but the the deal is you got to get off that high horse. You got to put Narcan in your schools amend your policy, get together with their school legal counsel, however you're going to do this and get it done. Um, Cause that's just the way that things are these days. So yeah, if you're trying to get virtue signaling or, or this is the hill you're going to stand on, it's the wrong hill to stand on. Um, so I'm, I'm very curious though, because I don't, I anticipate in my spring class, not everyone's going to be on board with this. I, I can almost guarantee that that not everybody's going to be on board with this. Um, and actually, you know, I don't know if I would have been on board with it, you know, when I was a younger administrator, I don't know. Um, but I would, you know, as word to the wise, and that's where I'm very overt with this. I'm like, you got to do this. You got to do this. And here's the, cons- here's the questions that are going to come up, right? Here's the things, here's what you got to ask of your state. Here's what you have to ask your state department of public instruction, you know, that, uh, School policies that you can have this stuff on campus. No one's going to get in trouble. Again, it's lock zone, and the lock zone isn't going to get you high or anything. Like that. The people aren't going to be breaking and stealing this stuff. But uh, let's keep going down here. Vanessa, oh my goodness, Vanessa, saying, we had three fentanyl exposures in an elementary school near here. They just arrested the one providing it to the kids. Holy, so Vanessa, right? So this is where. People might say, okay, we'll agree. People, school board of board of education, they would say, because the board of education is going to be a little bit cautious on this. 
if you have Narcan throughout all your buildings, students are open and rolling, parents are moving there. What message does that send to prospective parents? Oh yeah, this elementary school, this K through three has Narcan in every, we have three ADs in the building and each one has Narcan in the box. What, why, what's happening in your community? So the thing is, as you said, Vanessa, if you do this as a school board, it's every building, it's every site. So it's not, oh, we'll only do it at our high school because that's probably where it's going to happen. Nope, that's not the way that it works with fentanyl or opioid overdoses. Do you have staff that work in all buildings? Well, yeah, we do. Then this is just the way that it is. Do you have parents that come to all buildings? Yep, then this is the way that it is. So it's our good friend, Yuke. The thing that first responders can always get there in time, especially if no one knew the person was overdosing. You're right, the clock ticks. You're absolutely right. And so you, this is the point that needs to be made explicitly through these good Samaritan laws that are all at state levels of telling people, do this now, respond and do this now, you know, because time is ticking, right? And you're not going to get in trouble for this. You have immunity, but you're right. You're right on whether it's that, you know, whether it's stopping the bleed, um, administering an epi pen when someone is having a reaction before their throat swells up. I mean, we could go down the line on these, these things, but you're right on Uke. Um, and a lot of schools, we have 421 school districts in Wisconsin. Uh, more than half have less than a thousand students. Um, and of those, a lot are very rural, meaning volunteer fire department, volunteer EMS, two police you know, that patrol the entire county, you know, that's half of our state, um, plus blizzard conditions and things like that. You know, these states, these areas in winter, which uh, accessibility to, you know, the roads and stuff like that, you know, decreases um, the, the response time. So, yeah, really easy to administer. So um, we are... The first responders learn your first aids. Vanessa's right with that. That's actually a bigger reflection on society. We, all of us are the first responders. I don't know if that's a bad thing. I mean, there's a lot of bad things happening in society. But even if we took that statement back to 1930, I still think that's a really good statement. Um, that's Cajun Navy relief. When I interviewed Katie Pashan, and she was talking about Cajun Navy relief going into... Florida and in Louisiana, New Orleans after, you know, hurricanes Katrina and then eventually Harvey and things like that. And she said, you know, their slogan is we don't wait for the help. We are the help. And to some level that has to, that has to be the, the way that these systems work. Um, you know, I had a really good episode of flying rich. I need to bring him back on the show. And we we're talking, you know, he's a, but beyond a pilot, just so many talents he has, but he also is a 3d printing enthusiast. And we did a show on, what if you had a team of like eight people and they could deploy anywhere in the country in 24 hours and they had a, a three, they had a couple 3d printers that were super high end that could print anything. And they had the supplies and all that, and they could be, you know, airdropped in anywhere. What were things that could be printed during an emergency? And he was coming up catheters, like parts for geodesic domes, like water filtration systems. Like he was coming up with all these things that could be 3d printed, right? Because, if you're trying to fly things into a devastated area or all this stuff, it's not going to work. But if you if you could do some of this, this stuff, and it kind of gets in this whole thing too of like, remember, the Good Samaritan Law. I think this whole thing with Good Samaritan Law, I know I had Lisa Lenny on. She was great. We got into this topic topic pretty deep. We still need to go deeper on this. I, I am so dismayed that we don't have any federal or state um, education on the Good Samaritan Law. It, it just absolutely blows my mind. So, you know, we don't have this overt campaign about it. So, yeah. Yuke says to Vanessa, I took first aid with the scouts. Got a few EMT friends. We swap knowledge. It's, it's knowledge that's super valuable to you, right, buddy? Um, it's transdermal absorption with the fentanyl and some scary stuff. Keep hearing stories of little kids, even LEO. Yeah. So again, underscoring the need for that. And then in Cincinnati, the show a few shows ago that I had talking about their vending machine, typical vending machine. You used to get a candy bar out of it. Now you get a, 
a fentanyl test strip, a pair of of four mil uh, rubber gloves, and Narcan, right? But uh, yeah, um, we should be teaching first aid throughout life. Cover bleeding traumas. That's and that's the part Lisa Lenny brought up is like this whole kind of one and done. People, you know, uh, you, you're in the scouts, you go through first aid, like, but that should be free. And it should be something that you periodically take your refresher courses on. And it should, you know, publicly be made available, no cost to you. Um, right. It's all the money we spend on things as a government. And we don't have this. You know, you can go to the fire department, they'll take your blood pressure, right? At least where I'm at for free. But um, but will there be these these courses or will the government like pay a stipend to people to teach these courses? Like this is crazy when we're spending billions of dollars of other countries stuff and we're not saying hey you want to keep a current first aid card it's free go here and register and right vanessa i mean my girlfriend just got here fill her in on the podcast she usually complains wants me to get off youtube but she's also close home experience here and she's whoa well yuke so welcome her to the show all right um, yeah, Vanessa, the three kids handled the drug itself. They all died in minutes. Holy smokes. Wow. When you think about it, Narcan is less invasive than sticking someone in a leg with an EpiPen. Yeah. Yeah. And then after you administer Narcan, do you call 911? I believe you do. When you administer EpiPen, you always dial 911. That was our dial call 911. That was always our protocol when I was a school administrator. So it's our good friend, New York Outcast. I can't do any of the special graphics for you because I've got that shut off and I'm not going to try to revive that midstream here. But I feel bad. I can't do snow or lightning or all that for you guys. So I want to give a shout out here to our good friend, Mike McLuhan, who did a $20 super chat, a super sticker at the start of the show. Thank you very much. That brings us uh, probably within about $11 of this show getting a payout by the 31st of December. Um, so when I have my taxes done, I can say to my tax person, Gene, the show's been monetized. I'm officially a YouTuber. And here it is. We have a payout. We have to figure out how this has tax implications. But by gosh, Gene, the channel made it. So um, this is agorizer. By the by. As an aside, I really hate the use of the term epidemic for everything. That's a problem. Um, gun violence, epidemic, elements, the opioids is closer. But yeah, it's still like, you're right. You're right. Yeah, that is, I'm, I'm right on with you. Um, so bystander effect, this is from Uke. Um, It really sucks when things go down. So yeah, that's a, that's a good point. I think it's, I studied that and it was more, you know, if you were in a group of people in, in a chaotic situation and someone like started to like throw a, bed, um, a bench on a sidewalk through a window or something, you know, like you were more likely to join in that, even if that wasn't your nature, but also the bystander effect. If, um, if you see that someone is already, what was it? If you see that someone is already helping, like if they turn and ask you for help, you're much like much more likely. But if you see that there's people there and people aren't responding, you're less likely to respond. I'd have to look into that. I would actually have to do a show on that. I think I'll write that down. The bystander effect. Um, because it, that is, there is a well-studied science on that. Um, and especially nowadays, right? Because everyone's like, oh, I'm helping this person and I'm administering Narcan. There's some people over there, like four people are recording you. So is it being uploaded real time? Is that now evidence or, you know, so it's just really weird. Um, Mike to New York Outcast. I understand what you mean. I had a cousin with opioid addiction issues. Did several stints in county jail and burglary charges been clean for over a decade. Married with two great kids. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Agorizer, it's a problem. It's a drug. It's drug abuse. It's when it's um, adulterated substance, a predictable effect of the drug war. So they're too busy filming. Till, Misty, you got it, right? Like, um, 
how many people just bring out cameras today whenever something happens? So we have this weird, this this whole weird thing going on too. And I, I honestly don't believe people are bad innately and that people wouldn't help most people. But we don't emphasize the Good Samaritan law. And I also think once a camera comes out, that changes the game for a lot of people. Um, because again, are you being hyper scrutinized? And I think that's a good question. What if I'm administering Narcan and there are two people like recording what's going on? Is that now evidence? Is someone going to say, I didn't do the procedure right because I did like this and this or whatever. And I didn't, I didn't count to six after I like hit the, the mist injector. I mean, all these things. So, wow. Joe Morris, I probably logged 20 hours online safety training at work annually. So well, that's good, buddy. Your workplace is, is definitely um, invested in that. So. Is very good. Um, so I'm trying to get an. Uh, I live here in uh, Wisconsin. Those of you who know where Wisconsin is, so trying to get a Packers score. Just kind of curious here. The Green Bay Packers are currently leading in the fourth quarter, twenty-four to twelve over the Rams. So it's good news here for the Packers. So. It's good. It's good. If they win, they'll be six and eight, but we'll have one, two in a row, which is a good thing. So, um, so here's what I'm going to do, guys. I'm going to be back, but right now it is, um, what's the temperature? 18 degrees. I need to uh, stoke the firewood and uh, I'll be back. And uh, I'll do, I'll talk a little bit more about a blizzard, which is heading our way, which is going to get here Thursday. The worst blizzard we've had, or the worst kind of winter event, but probably blizzard in five years. It could even be longer than that. This could be going, this could be like a once in a decade weather event that is happening here. So, Andrew's saying we have an epidemic calling everything epidemic. Yeah, some things are endemic, some things are epidemic, some things are just a low key where you blame things like, oh, like, you know, break ins, that's due to the pandemic or whatever. Um, but you're right. It's a term that's kind of lost its practical meaning. So guys, friends here, the show, super chat, super stickers are appreciated. Watching the ads are appreciated. Clicking through the ads also appreciate it. Um, kind of a shameless plug, but we are trying. And I say we, as a me and that penguin back there is putting a lot of pressure on me. He's looking over my shoulder, trying to get the show where it does have a payout here in 2023. We're approaching it. Appreciate all of you. So, guys, what I'm going to do is I'll be back in just a moment. I uh, I'm going to run our intermission because if I don't stock up with firewood, uh, we're going to have a super cold house here tonight. So I need to uh, to refill the burner. So let me find our intermission. So intermission, and I'll be back after that. It's three minutes long. Okay, folks, I'll be back after these three minutes. Thank you. <laughs>
As chaos erupts, torrents of conflicting yet urgent messages gush from media outlets. What is the magnitude of the incident and what should people do to protect themselves? Dr. David Perodin clarifies human behavior during days, weeks, months, or even years of chaos. Reporter James David Dixon of the Detroit News proclaims, the velocity of information is an education in the way people react and adapt to change. Never has it been more important to sift facts and stories for truth and meaning. The velocity of information will teach you how people have done it in history, in the modern day, and even in prison. There are teachable moments on every page. Buy the Velocity of Information, Human Thinking During Chaotic Times. Available from your favorite bookstore or online retailer. A must read for parents, teachers, and taxpayers. Dr. David Perodin has written the most honest book about the $3 billion school safety industrial complex. Attorney James Sibley proclaims, a brave demonstration of speaking truth to power, School of Errors rips the lid off the billion dollar school safety industry. Using real world examples of successful responses in desperate situations, David contrasts the expensive window dressings pitched to panic parents with the inexpensive and effective approaches proven to actually work. Read this book before you let your school waste another precious dollar on meaningless safety theater. Buy the international bestseller, School of Errors, Rethinking School Safety in America, now at Barnes & Noble or Amazon. Hey everybody, I'm back. Took a little longer than I thought there to, uh, to restoke the stoker. So, um, yeah, keep my house with wood, obviously, so burn down. Um, so let's go through here. Dancing in the bad cave. Let's go to the lobby. Dun 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 dun. Piccolo and a cane. Mike McLoon. Mike, thank you for the super chat earlier in the show. The super sticker, I should say. Very much appreciate. You're a very generous person. All of you, thank you for supporting my work. For um, you know, letting those ads play when they come up. Um, and you know, your support of the monetized channel. Uh, I do appreciate that very much. So thank you. Thank you for that. Um, very much appreciate it. So um, important books to, or right here, Solitude is Sing. I got your audiobook, Doc. It's awesome. Thank you, buddy. Yeah. Um, important books to study. You know, it's amazing that the velocity of information every day becomes more um, a truth reality. Everything in here is cited. You know, the 471 endnotes, 12 interviews. It's an awesome book. But um, the more you distance yourself from the year 2020 and you start to read the book, you're like, oh, my God. <laughs> like, holy smokes, right? New Mexico with their Vax to the Max program and you get a free fishing license for a vaccine. And then people eventually were like, yeah, I'm not really into that. And, uh, but it was, it was pretty cool. <laughs> so what you're saying is pretty right. I ran from here to the fireplace or the, to the firewood room, grabbed firewood and went upstairs. And um, then it took a little longer because I had to move, um, the what was in the firebox around a little bit and then once i got everything in there just had to wait a second like okay is this how i i want it set up if the fire gets too high it messes with the intakes in the in the burner um and then it's not as efficient and if you really mess with it it can actually like turn the burner into this big glowing you know hunk of multi-hundred pound metal that's sitting in your house um and i'm not no i'm not anywhere in that situation right now, but that has happened. Usually happens like once or twice a year, the stove overheats. That is more like weather conditions outside. Um, if it's really cold like this, it's never a problem because the, the heat goes really fast up the chimney. Um, you know, it already circulates many times throughout the, the house and stuff, but 
it's more, when it's more like, you know, 30 degrees and dense that uh, you can have where you can have the, the actual firebox starts to, to overheat if you're not sending enough air up through the chimney. But, but yeah, I don't have to deal with that now. A couple of times I stayed, I'd stayed up at night and uh, just in that room to make sure. I don't know what it would really do. I'd, I'd, I'd have to scrape. I usually scrape the hot coals out and uh, try to just lower the heat. That's probably just what it would have to do. Uh, it usually takes care of itself um, in time. Awesome book. Thanks, Misty, Mrs. Wayne. So let me see here. I think the book is uh, um, School of Airs. Let's see here. School. No. School of World. So I think it, I think it is in more libraries right now. It's slowly searching. Anyway, I, it, it was in more libraries as of uh, a couple days ago. So that's always fun. Like I said, it's really gaining traction now. Um, yeah, it is really good. It's really good. So um, very cool. So, yeah. Um, so a few things. One is... Where I'm at, we have a blizzard coming in. So today is Monday. On Thursday, it will arrive. And between Thursday and Friday, there's a blizzard warning. They're already telling people. And they're like, it's not even like a watch. They're like, it's high confidence. It will be a warning. It's going to be bad. And, uh, and so we could get a foot of snow in that range. It's going to be... 10 degrees, five degrees. So really light snow. But the problem with that is that stuff blows around and it causes big drifts and it white out conditions. Um, and then on the roads, salt doesn't work because the next week it's going to be below, you know, 15 degrees every day. So it's really, you know, really dangerous driving, especially at night. But um, we will have 50 mile an hour winds with the storm. And uh, eat about a foot of snow, and it will last 48 hours. So that's pretty wild. We haven't had that here in, I'm thinking, five years. It could be much more than that. It actually could be like 10 years. But, uh, but yeah, so hopefully, you know, people can stay safe, stay off the roads. I'm going to go shopping tomorrow. I put a list together of just some extra things to get. Um, thankfully, like in our community, the power is underground, but you never know. Um, you know, what the deal is with the power, but, uh, it's definitely don't want to be out. The kids have off school on Friday, but they'll cancel school. I'm sure on Thursday. And, uh, and then it's just, it's holiday week, you know, Christmas, the 24th and 25th, you know, those will probably be okay. But as long as the winds don't kick up, but these rural roads will probably be a mess, um, over Christmas. So I remember that, you know, growing up in northern Wisconsin, you know, just roads would close. They they would just be drifted over. That would be the end of it unless the snowplow came through. That was it. You just, you couldn't go. And uh, so it's been quite a while since I've had to experience that. I remember snow as high as the uh, telephone wires when I was growing up out in the country. A very, I remember that very vividly. Um, but yeah, we are, we're going to, the th the thing is the winds, right? and how the snow will set up is going to be really crazy. But uh, I'm so glad I went out after this past week's snowstorm and got the snow off of all of our shrubs and off of my spruce the best I could in the back because it was really heavy snow and it, branches were breaking off because this would really mess things up. But um, we're only supposed to get four inches of snow, so... You're supposed to get four inches of snow where you're at, Bacon? Holy smokes. That's pretty rare, right? Wow. Um, we might be getting snow. This is misty, Mrs. Wayne. Uh, but they still haven't made up their minds. Yeah. So, you know, we have, one of the things we did is we now have an all-wheel drive SUV. And um, so I, I believe that we got it last year. And I think that helps in winter with snow. With ice, it doesn't really make too much of a difference. It doesn't make any difference on braking, but uh, but at least that's something kind of a go-to. My car will be out of commission 
my car will, my lacrosse, my front wheel drive lacrosse, there's not enough weight in the front, even though, you know, front wheel drive, it just doesn't, you know, on days like that, like until things get really sandy, we're on top of a hill. I can, and, and people won't be able to get up our hill. So what typically happens is uh, people who try to come up the hill, they just like drift over to one side or another. And I end up going down there with a shovel and cat litter and stuff and like getting people shoveled out. I, um, that will probably happen again. Um, the city would probably just be best to shut our road down temporarily. But, uh, and then it's a weird thing. I helped, I helped this lady out a couple of years ago and she was freaking out. And I'm like, well, you're in town. And this, you haven't done any damage to your vehicle. It's just, you know, you're kind of stuck. And, you know, so I'm like, shut your car off so I can shovel with a plastic shovel around in, and then I'll put some litter down and give you some traction and stuff like that. And I'll, you know, you'll get out of this. Don't worry about that. You back down and, and uh, just give me a little bit of time to help you out. And then these people always like try to start their car. And then they're always like, they're sort of freaking out. They're calling all these people. And I'm like, you know, there's this lady's like, oh, should I should call a wrecker. I'm like, I'll, you'll be fine. 15 minutes. I'm, you're not paying me anything. I live here. I know how this process works. And then I've never had one person that I've not been able to get unstuck just as a nice doc, as the nice person here. But people freak out. So I'm like, just give it a little, give me a little bit of time here, get the snow away and get a little traction. And then, um, but yeah, our road will be, be, pretty much useless <laughs> so um but you know because we're in the city it'll be a, a day and they'll have a cleanup it's our friend jordan from south korea or saskatchewan either one is he's dual resident welcome buddy we are we have a blizzard warning inbound here for where i'm at not a good time to take out your airplane says graham wilson i would agree with that you don't want to be going down the uh taxiway when there's a four foot snow drift with your piper, I'll flip you right over. So, grrr, woof, woof, woof. Good friend, Mike McClone. Remember, ice is no equal is the equalizer. Yeah. When I was involved in the multi car accident on the interstate, I was in the middle of that. That was icing over the interstate, and it it I could see in front of me the vehicle start to lose it, and then I my vehicle start to lose it too. And that was horrible, man. Like, you know, snow's one thing, just regular snow. You can kind of trudge through that. That's not great, but when this icing over stuff happens. And again, salt's not going to work when it's 10 degrees outside. So, oh, man, really sucks. Really sucks. That's another benefit of, like, having the home studio to consult in. Like, for the most part, it just doesn't matter because <laughs> I'm just down here. If power goes out, then it matters. Buying a new snowblower... Um, Vanessa, next fall, we are you going to get battery operated? Because my local snowblower, small engines place, every snowblower they have this fall is battery. They do not have a gas powered snowblower, believe it or not, they don't. So, I am going to take good care of my snowblower. Um, Jordan's saying, I can't stay in South Korea, I don't know anything about snow. Jordan's a good guy. So I appreciate that you're here, buddy. So I need a rhyme for y'all. Yeah, Jordan's a good guy. Jordan is a, is a good person. Um, really? Okay. In my area, they're all moved over. So, yeah. Like, I really take care of my, my snowblower, my weed whacker, my lawnmower. Because, like I said, they're not selling. There's not an option anymore. Um, it has to be, so it's pretty, pretty freaky, but, uh, I use true fuel. I don't know if you guys are familiar with that. It's synthetic gasoline, but it doesn't contain any ethanol. It's 92 octane. Um, it comes in like quartz. I have six quartz on reserve and I use that for my winter. So for my snowblower. And even if it's a really big snow or blizzard, like I probably wouldn't go through more than a quart with that. If I help my neighbors, maybe two quarts, but I can, you know, I can order more of it. it comes from Home Depot and stuff like that. But uh, I always use it because otherwise just even like the, 
it, the regular gas, even if it says no ethanol, it would still gum up the carburetor. So I just went with synthetic. Never had a problem after that. Uh, otherwise, every year I was having to take the carburetor apart and clean it. Jordan is saying to Vanessa, I was just thinking of you before the doc mentioned cat litter. So we have three cats. Yeah, I take cat litter and um, that is usually what I use to get people unstuck. The biggest thing I found is not the people, it's not the logistics, it's not the technicalities, it's just getting people to calm down. And, you know, and I'm like, hey, like I live right there. Like, you know, you haven't done any damage to your vehicle, at least I can see. Because, you know, and just let me shovel you out. Like, I'm guessing you don't have a shovel with you and I'll make sure, you know, I'm not your vehicle and I'll get you out for, I'll get you out of here. Don't worry about it. So. If I can find a tri-fuel snowblower, that'd be nice. Yeah. So tri-fuel is just, um, or true fuel is just uh, synthetic gas. So I, you just use it instead of, you know, your regular um, recreational vehicle, unleaded. It's just, un, it's, you know, just unleaded gas. But it, it, because it's synthetic, it'll, you know, you can store it for two years. It doesn't have ethanol. I, I won't. It objectively changed. It was a game changer for me. I never had to clean out a gummy carb after that. Um, so it's somewhat expensive, but I'm not running my snowblower a whole lot in winter. So it's definitely worth it to me. I wouldn't run it like in a lawnmower or something like that. It just wouldn't it'd be too expensive to do that. But um, Jordan's saying, bye. Bye for now. I'm Jordan. See you later. Ipaniwaz. Never seen one. It's our good friend, Mike McLuhan. So, yeah. So what what do you guys think? What for opioids? Um, do you think library, there should be a standing order? So, you know, your library could have Narcan available in a, your post office, your city hall, uh, your schools. Should this be a thing? Um, what do you think run, what do you think are the pros, the con, the cons, what are things that I'm missing? Because we're kind of moving really fast in this direction. Um, so, you know, tell me what you think, because I am very interested in that. I don't think I have everything covered. Um, so Yeah. Joe Morris is saying my buddies ran true fill in their chainsaws. Yep. I run it in my weed whacker. Um, again, I've immediately found it to be well worth the price. So, yeah. Hell, let's pay a 16 year old kid to drive around in a Narcan ice cream truck. So, Joe Morris. So, wouldn't that be something? Wouldn't that be some commentary of having, you know, I remember the ice cream truck. Actually, they had an ice cream truck that would visit our town up until like two years ago um, and, and driving around. But it kind of, it's, you know, it's it's one of those things. Do you, do you, um, do you put these at the parks, right? We have a, a swimming area at a, a lake that's in town do you put one right there along with uh, the first aid kit or the the buoy you throw out to people is there like narcan i mean where do you where do you put these things because actually that would you have to call 911 you have to get the police or do all police cruisers have these or i don't know it's a good question vanessa yeah narcan in kits along with other first aid yeah and you're really vanessa i think you're pointing out too that the traditional um, AED cabinet um, has changed. It's no longer the AED. It really is the, it's the, I don't know if you call it like the medical cabinet. Like all this needs to be kind of re repurposed, re -des described in a different way that's more reflective of what it does. So an AED cabinet has an AED. It has a first aid kit. It has EpiPen. It has Narcan. It's really a medical cabinet. I don't, I don't know of a school that's done that. It's always like the AED thing, and the signage is always like AED. I think it really needs to be medical. And I don't know what a universal sign is for EpiPen or Narcan or something like that, or if you just, you know, I don't know if there is a universal sign 
for nar I mean it's naloxone naloxone. Let me see here. Universal symbol for Narcan. I mean AED always um pretty pretty evident. So let's let's bring this up here on a share screen. So this is sold by Illinois Supply Company. It's a sign. So purple, I guess that's the color. Well, no, here's one that's red. So I just said it was purple. So then, then they come up here with red. But red is too much first aid, right? You almost have to do like purple. So let's see here. Let's see what they have. Purple. See, this one would make sense to me. Like I think you'd have to color code it out. But these are all things that kind of have, people have to make decisions on, like at some point, right? Like you gotta, you gotta decide what you're gonna do here. And that's where I look at this bill from like, you know, Senator Baldwin and I'm like, okay, I get where you're going with this. Um, I don't think it's a bad thing, but right, there's, you know, there's a lot of questions to be asked here. So, um, Benning Ballistics will say, hey, Narcan in the hands of untrained individuals just as bad as opioid issues. So, right, that is going to come up. How do you respond to that? Mike McLuhan, I ran Truefill, which is not a narcotic, by the way, in my two-cycle equipment. I've never had any fuel related issues, but it's pricey. It is pricey, but I'm with you, Mike. I am a believer in Truefill. After so many winters of having to rip down my carburetor in my snowblower and be like, enough of this. Especially when it's like after a blizzard hits, right? And I'm sitting there and I can't get the thing going. Never, ever had that issue when I did true feel. Overdose ballot equals no more vote. It's our good friend, Andrew. So if an ice cream truck makes it out to my house, it's pretty sketch. Ice cream <laughs> truck. Joe Morris, you know, I I really feel bad that the ice cream truck stuff is uh, is is kind of over, you know, because it's cost prohibitive, right? To to do that, um, but I re it wasn't that long ago. I mean, my kids, you know, lived through the ice cream truck age, and there was something just really grounding, really good about that. So, um. Yeah, I'm glad when I grew up, we didn't have that where I was at. Oh, subscribe and thumbs up, by the way. Appreciate that. So uh, let's keep going. Dun, dun, dun. I use stable, my lawnmower. I also use stable in my gas that I've left over for my lawnmower. So that's been good. Lawnmower burns hotter, you know, so the carb is usually... I've never had issue with a lawnmower carb. Um, and you're burning it for a longer, you know, it's running for a longer period of time. Um, but anyway, ballistics, we should take label, warning labels off everything and let natural selection run its course. Jim. Jim. Um, propane has a maximum shelf life for a common fuel. Look it up. So, Yeah. It's all good stuff. All good stuff. So, um, I don't know. Has anybody been, you know, been through a blizzard, been through really, really crazy weather? Any of that going on? Because, you know, I'm from Wisconsin, so this isn't new for us. But this, this is the first time, like for my daughters, this will probably be the first true blizzard that they will remember. Um, so... Yeah. Um, you know, what do you, what do you think? Have you been through anything that's been like, Oh, I remember a blizzard. I, I lived in Buffalo and we have four feet of snow. And so it's not the snow so much because we don't have, we, we don't have a lot of snow on the ground. It's the fact that the 50 mile an hour winds for 48 hours create whiteout conditions, which is a big, big problem. So, you know, that's that's what things get 
really nasty. Um, we're supposed to get snow on Sunday, betting ballistics. Yeah, on Christmas. Wow. So we are under a blizzard warning Thursday through Saturday, although by the time we hit Saturday, it could ease up quite a bit. It depends how fast the winds move through, but they're saying 48, 48 hours of 50 mile an hour winds in with a foot of snow in 10 degree weather. So it's like a minus 30 wind chill and it's be pretty wild, man, to, to have that come through. Um, so yeah. Um, Mike McLuhan, Jim, not sure what a fill costs now, but a 20 pound cylinder exchange at local grocery store. It's up to 28 bucks. It was 20 over the summer. Holy smokes, my man. It's costly. What is it? In California, I think they banned small propane, right? Canisters, right? So if you got a little buddy or something, it doesn't really, won't work anymore as far as that goes. So, oh my God, guys, that's crazy. So the weather right here is it's snowing now. I don't know if I'll have to do anything tomorrow or not um, as far as I get the snow out. We'll see. Um, so an update on my hard drive that had all of the Safety Doc podcasts. The uh, the tech guy called me and he said, Dave, I ordered, I got another panel for it, another board. I tried it out. It didn't revive it. So it's definitely something is wrong on the drive. So tomorrow I will pick up the drive. I'll pay him. I did download the first 150 episodes, which took a long time. So I have the full video and full audio, but I don't have like the component stuff going into that. Not that I would probably really ever need that, but uh, um, over Christmas break, I will do the final. I have like 30 missing episodes that I'll go in and, and download. But uh, back up your stuff, guys, and back up your backups because... You know, my my wife spent a lot of time in the last couple of weeks uh, going through our pictures of our our family pictures and making print copies of those. Um, you know, sending them to Walgreens. We have a Wal Walgreens in town, and and uh, making sure we have those. We have redundant things, but you know, get get those copies. Don't don't have everything you know on a thumb drive or something like that, and then it goes bad. So. Um, let's go over here to our good friend, Bacon Maldino. Bacon, I remember when hot Russian and I lived in June Lake, California. We arrived the night before a 36 inch snow came in. Holy smokes. Wow. Mike McClune, I usually keep a five gallon uh, can filled. And after I dump it in to pick up and refill it, when I go get gas, run to Ohio. Good move. By the way, I um, I, I spread some ash out on a, a couple icy areas on like the driveway, and uh, ash does a nice job of giving some grit to that. You don't want to get real crazy with it though, because um, it becomes kind of pasty, and cars start to bring it into the garage, and so you just got to be very, you know, just thoughtful that you're not putting a whole bunch of ash out. But ash does look great to bring traction and and. Uh, melt away ice so little ash i should have some sand but i don't but i tend ash is pretty abundant here considering we're burning <laughs> we're burning a forest down every night here um we have 100 pound tanks i want to buy 40 pound tanks 100 pounds are difficult to move no kidding they certainly are jim is saying i found two stroke engines more oil and fuel is better than not enough I'm with you, buddy. Yeah, I run 50 to 1, but a little more oil, not a bad thing, especially a little synthetic, a little AMS oil. Real life anecdotes. I have 21 gas cans I'll use regularly. The rest are for yard equipment. Rotate them. Smart move, Vanessa. What I do when I use my true fuel is I write the dates on the cans that I got them in marker. I just write it on the top of them. And then as I crack them open and use them, I write the date that I started to use it. So I always have that going for me, which is nice. I have six gas cans. Whoa. I really should get a jerry can. That should be on my list. Get a jerry can. Through Gritz Garage. 
Blend, Penny Ballistics. You know what works better than ash and sand on a driveway dock? Um, I don't. So I don't know what the answer is. I try not to do salt, but um, yeah, the ash is my burning firewood. So um, my scooter I bought in 98, 160 miles per gallon, two gallon gas tank. That is awesome. Yeah, AMS oil. So I ordered directly from AMS oil in uh, was it Duluth, Minnesota? Right? Is that where it's at, or it's in it's in Minnesota? So AMS oil. Um, oh, metal gas cans from Midwest cans. Their customer service exceptional. Awesome. Living in a warm climate is where it doesn't snow, Benning Ballistics. Yeah. I'm glad that I spent the time cleaning my driveway off and my new concrete slab uh, because they're, they were pretty much bare. My neighbors, like, they didn't keep up on their stuff. So, like, that'll just be ice covered from now until, like, March for them. Um, so, my buddy Carl is an Amsoil dealer. I'm a big fan of Amsoil. So... Dun, dun, dun. Amsoil. So, yeah. Um, so, I think I think in the next, I think in 2023, you're going to see a federal legisla legislation pass to have a standing order for Narcan. Now, some of the drug companies have come out on this and they've said, well, you know what? The deal is you can do this, but then, you know, Right now, Narcan, because it's prescribed, is covered by quite a few insurance companies where if it's over the counter, it's not going to be covered. So how are you going to deal with that? And then also the fact of, you know, supply chain, if it's over the counter, this might become harder to source. So how are you going to deal with that? Those are, com those are questions coming out from the uh, pharmaceutical industry, which doesn't surprise me, I guess, but... You know, these are questions, right, of what are you going to do? What are you going to do if, uh, you know, and then what if, you know, what if some people can't pay that? You know, it's $25, I guess. I mean, I looked up, it's $25 now, but what if it goes up to $50? And people are like, well, if, if, if it was under my insurance plan or if it was under my whatever, you know, Medicare, Medicaid. But so I look at that, I'm like, well, that's kind of fear mongering. So but I guess it's kind of legit. You know, it's like, why don't we have affordable insulin for people or affordable EpiPens? So, note to everyone, check on Husky, on your Husky owner neighbors. We are not faring well in this weather. Oh, no. Okay. It's not good. Our weather is still showing only rain. Yeah. Yeah. Make gas cans great again. God, Mike, I have one of those gas cans. Remember when they they came out with this, the new law where it had to have all these mechanisms on it so it wouldn't spill or vapors wouldn't come out? And and uh, and that thing is still horrible to operate versus a traditional gas can. Um, yeah, that thing is always a mess. And it's a mess to disassemble it and take it to the gas station and fill it up and <laughs> reassemble it. I'm like, this makes no sense. You know, those type of things are just an example of government overreach. Jim, I thought it'd be good to rig up a tank and a pump deal here, but trailer park people have their natural gas lines freeze in Metro Detroit in recent memory. Oh, my God. Yeah. My God. Wow. Wow. So, yeah, thankfully, what we have coming toward us, we don't have a lot of driving on deck. We should be able to, you know, I said the big thing here, and because it's cold, that's that's one thing. If you have a power outage because it's 110 degrees, you know, everything spoils. You know, if it's zero degrees outside, you can move a lot of stuff to the porch and it'll still be good, right? So you do have that kind of, I don't know. I wouldn't say it's a benefit, but that's just the reality of the situation. Uh, but I am, I do have a kind of a list of supplies that including batteries that I'm going to stock up on tomorrow. Um, 
you know, just, just because uh, I don't know what the next, you know, those 48 hours are going to kind of entail or, or ongoing for us. Um, again, I, I live in a city, so I, I don't anticipate we would have real long of issues that would be going on here. Power lines are traditionally under underground and stuff. The generating plant is just out of town, but uh, but we'll see. So, um, bacon. I have the older gas cans. New ones or safety locks are beyond painful to use. Right? Yeah, I would actually. I would prefer to go to like a a uh, you know flea market and buy an older style gas can um, from somebody. The same thing with like sprinklers for yards like any pre-1980 sprinklers are pretty decent and you can pick those up now and then in like a flea market but like all the new stuff is just plastic or rust or just junk so yeah 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 so and many of those legal spots are difficult to use with disabilities so i had my one of my neighbors came over elderly lady her husband and, and she she said uh Hey, like, would you help me with this? Uh, she had a jar of something. She's like, I can't open this thing. And it did have some kind of like push down thing. It wasn't a medication or whatever, but I'm like, yeah, sure. I'll open it. No problem. But I'm like, it's kind of weird, you know, like, cause she said, yeah, a lot, a lot of this stuff is getting really difficult to kind of open. Um, it's a good point, Vanessa. Benny Ballistics. Uh, Mike, I agree. I have a friend that does it. Uh, they have all sorts of pistols pull on them at times. Whoa. Whoa. So buy the electric fuel pumps and jigger ciphers. Stop struggling with the spouts. It's our friend Vanessa. Bacon. Benny Ballistics. Whoa. That's going to make a game show. Look at this, man. Oh, my goodness, man. So, um, oh, Saltwood Server, th that's a lot of snow, Doc. Yeah, yeah, it's a lot of snow. I mean, we've had bigger snows. It's the wind. It's the 50-mile-an-hour winds that move. So, you know, at the end of a road, you could have a four-foot snowdrift. Like, that's very plausible in this scenario. So then, and it would, you know, snow blowing over roads and whiteouts, so that's a bad thing. A Packers one, good deal. Um. Best milk crates are at Tractor Supply. Use three crates to use electric pump and four for the siphon. Very cool. Mike, to betting ballistics. I even have access to keys to the cars, but I still said nope to repo for me. Um, this was when I was living in Lima, Ohio, going to school. Right? Remember, Mike has a lot of shirts. It's like Lima. Hey, Lima proud of Lima, Ohio. Lima, the Lima lizards. And they were like, it's big. But then yeah, after a while, it's like, well, whatever. But Lima, Lima, Ohio. So Mike McLoon, Lima. Doc, my neighbor behind me is arguing with repo guy while they're taking his car. Yeah. I don't know if you're going to win that argument, right? Probably, probably lose that one. Yeah, I, that's a dangerous job doing that. Best nose I've ever experienced were in Alaska. That's Vanessa. Yeah, I had some some memorable and good snows as a kid um, in northern Wisconsin, you know, where you get the three-wheeler out and be driving around and right up and down the roads. And so, you know, now it's all really pragmatic. It's like, oh, I don't want anybody to get hurt, you know, and let's stay inside till the roads are plowed and um so yeah all of those types of things so yeah yeah batteries i got my list together of things not a big list I mean, we're pretty well pretty well set but probably grab a couple hand warmers let me put that on my list here i've got some but i don't know if those things expire it's a thing man i don't know if, how long they stay i know they're not cheap either anymore it used to be remember you get like a whole sack of them for like a dollar um that's not the case man so let's do this hand warmers 
I'm just going to shove those in the car. I've got space in there to do that. Yeah, I'll probably throw a couple glow sticks in there too. I've got a couple of military grade extra glow sticks. Not that they throw off heat, but, you know, if anything ever did happen, right, you can hopefully use it for some visibility or something. I don't know. Um, Jim is saying tow truck drivers, tow truck drivers are the unsung heroes of modern society. Yeah. When I was in my, uh, my accident back in 2019, the tow truck driver took me right to my house. It's really, really cool thing that he did that. Um, wow. Well, that's be at least a country Western Ballard starring a tow truck driver. I agree. So Coolio. Well, everybody, here's where we're at. Um, we I'll have the blog post up tomorrow, episode 199 officially the safety doc. That's the one that has the audio and the blog post. It was opioid emergencies in K-12 schools, community and legal considerations. It's very likely that in 2023, there will be federal legislation for a standing order. There's already a bill proposed, Senate Bill 4794. You will have a standing order so you can use um, naloxone, right? Um, or Narcan, generic Narcan. What does that mean for schools? That was our topic. What do schools have to think about in that school boards? How are they training people? Where are they going to put this stuff? What does liability look like? Um, culturally, are some schools going to say, we're not going to do that because, right, parents come here, we don't want them to think that open enrollment, we have a drug overdose issue going on. So we'll see where this goes. Um, but yeah. And what was the, uh, <laughs> there was a, there was something I was going to do a show on. I didn't write it down. I said I was going to write it down. Do you guys remember what it was? We were talking about it about 30 minutes ago. And I said, I'm going to do a show on that. So cause can anybody post that? What was I going to do a show on? Um, bystander effect. By God, by God, my good friend. Yeah. Bystander effect. That's going to be a great show. Probably be show 200 unless I have the t the hemp manufacturer on um, for that. So, yeah. Crisco, right? You're supposed to uh, lather yourself up with uh, Crisco, and that preserves your heat in your body so you don't cool down. Um, bystander effect. Good deal. Good deal. Um all right. Well, I appreciate all of you. Uh, Mike McLuhan, thanks for the uh, super sticker. Thank everybody. Thank you to everybody for, um, you know, watching the ads, <laughs> support, checking through the show and doing that. It does make a difference. Um, it's a good thing. It's all good. Um, as for me personally, yeah, Doc's doing good. I, um, you know, I've, I started the consulting last month again. That's been going well. I have, uh, so my schedule's filling up and I shared earlier in the show that today I contacted my primary, um, you know, entity that I work with. And I said, I'm willing to give you 10 to 12 more hours if you want it. But they were asking for that initially. And I said, no, I'm not willing to kind of come back to that level. And, uh, and honestly, I'm not trying to freak anybody out. Maybe this is my own paranoia, <laughs> my own skewed perception of things. I think the economy is going to be very bad in 2023. And I think right through the election in 2024, before we might see some changes. And I, I mean, I have friends in different countries who are sharing things that are happening, right? And I have friends in California or, you know, the, how they're, the homeless communities in Santa Barbara are just uh, significantly higher than they've ever been. The water shortages, their utility bills, you know, my, I know my year over year expense on my property taxes. So all these things are just real. They're, all of us, Vanessa was saying she went and, you know, bought eggs and how expensive they were. Um, we know the supply chain, chain shortages are still existing. I don't see these getting better under our current management. Do you? Our current administration? I don't at all. Um, and I just said, you know what? I am, uh, I'm going to add another 10 to 12 hours if you want it. 
because I, I need to hedge my bets here. Um, and they said, yeah, absolutely. We'll take it. We'll, as I said, they said, when are you available? I'm like, here's the times and get back to me, you know, obviously probably after Christmas and let me know what works. What's strange is I d- initially d- designed my schedule that I had, I would have off every Friday and it didn't turn out that way. Um, everyone wanted a Friday. And the reason is most schools you now use Friday as a professional development day, either half day or full day, like once or twice a month. It's very common. So they're like, well, Dave, we already have this built in as professional development. So it's just easier for us to contract with you on this day. I'm like, okay, I get it. And for me, I guess it doesn't really mean a big thing. Like, it's not like I'm leaving early on a Friday to go to like a vacation home on the, you know, up on a lake, but Um, I said, I need to preserve one day a week though, because, you know, my university stuff, I need always like one day to be able to do things and uh, that I can count on. So that day became Tuesday, which was really kind of weird. So like I have off the weekend, I worked Monday, you know, full days, seven to five, and then Tuesday's off and then Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and then the weekend off, you know, so it's all good. I mean, but uh, it, it is kind of weird that Tuesday became the day I don't work. <laughs> so, but, you know, um, but I'm telling, I, 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 I'm not a fear monger. I'm not trying to do that. I'm just looking at the metrics of saying, um, you know, this is bad. Like the, the number of people also under age 35, from age 18 to 35 who live at home is at a record high. And like the last time it was like back in like 1940, but like, then that, those are like farm families, you know, living at home. That's a different thing. And then, you know, these metrics and, and, you know, like my stock advisor, he's like, well, Dave, you know, like if you hold on in markets and, you know, whatever, I'm like, but dude, under the same premise though, like then the Great Repression, the Great Depression would repeat, right? If you're saying that, that the past repeats, then all the bad things in the past repeat in addition to the good things. And really had the U.S. not entered World War II, and there was also the Dust Bowl. You know, the Great Depression was really 33 to 42 to 45, maybe 12, 15 years. I'm like, dude, I'm I'm that young chicken. I don't have that time. So I am, uh, yeah, moving out of all of my securities positions, 100% out of them, and, uh, and over into, you know, fixed and on that side, just because I think things are going to drop off a cliff. Um, so... Unfortunately, that's that's just the way. Like, I don't know if you if you guys look at things, but what is going to make things better? I said the you know the U.S. is really largely becoming a service sector. You know, it's haircuts, it's uh, it's restaurants, it's things like that, and industries you know gone or it's being you know, um, you know, robots and automation and and I just I don't you know, the thing is, and do you believe in anybody? in power in the white house in your state government you know i don't you know these these folks what in the world so i'm like i'm really amazed that the supply chain um has been messed up for eight months right because last year this time it wasn't that bad um but then you know because you'd think well with a with a uh, capitalism, right? Capitalism would solve a supply chain. It's like after a hurricane, capitalism gets water and batteries and gas into a hurricane area, but people have to pay more. It's price gouging. I understand. But um, but the reality is no one's been able to solve this. No FedEx, no UPS, no businesses. Amazon can't do it. You can't have efficiencies when all of these systems are, um, I would say, manipulated to be broken. And that is really scary because usually, again, in capitalism, someone will come up through with a breakthrough. Oh, here's like your drone thing. Or here we're going to use like these smaller vans to like break down things and get them delivered. Or we're going to use whatever to manufacture. We're going to jump to 3D printing and it's going to all be regional. So things just get shifted by code to the 3D printers and print it. Like none of that's happened. So I look at this and I'm saying, this is bad. This is really bad because usually capitalism wins out over the long haul or innovation. Someone comes up with something. Oh, here's a laptop battery that lasts for four weeks and it's not happening. So, um, 
Jim is saying the Great Depression, seven more years of these types of economic decisions would kill me unless I can seriously plan B my entire life. Well, don't be depressed, but I think be real, be realistic. I'm really just, I'm anticipating entropy in the economy for the next five years. Um, like I said, what would turn it around? It's not just the U.S. You know, I have friends in Germany who have had their Christmas lights taken by the authorities. They've come to their house and taken their Christmas lights because they said, we're in a power shortage. You can have an LED Christmas light, which costs a penny to operate for the week, right? Um, and, you know, the I, I just, I don't, I definitely don't see it until the 2024 election, depending upon which way that goes, that could, you know, but I'm like, I, in my 51 years, I've never perceived things like this. I've talked to people who are 30 years older than me who have said they've never perceived things like this. You know, I've been through the 70s, the hyperinflation of the 70s and stuff like that. That doesn't compare to now. Um, you know, one thing in the 70s, you know, you didn't ha you didn't open up your paper to see Grand Theft Auto. You know, that, oh, last over the weekend, 17 cars were stolen here in, you know, the community. You know, you didn't see that type of stuff. So... I would say, you know, just, you know, be defensive. Um, you've got to do what you got to do for your own investments. But I'm looking at stuff and I'm like, I I cannot have exposed flanks. Look at people who held Disney stock, for example. Disney's trading at under $90 a share. Disney was a $200 stock with a dividend. And these people were loyal to Disney. These are people who own the company and would go there, like own the stock and go to Disney like three times a year. And, you know, and, and they're not watching, they're not doing the subscriptions, they're not going to the parks. The parks, I mean, the parks are a liability to try to do the upkeep on that and people trying, you know, to fly to these things. And, and you know, so who would have thought, I was reading that the mathematical, so if you took like Microsoft being down 50%, Amazon, uh, Meta, and Disney, and then you did your, what's your statistical probability of that happening? It was more likely that you would win the Powerball than that those four things would happen. So outside of like a one-time black swan event, um, a meteor hits Earth, right? Yeah, well, then that's off the table. But it is, it is, it is really crazy. And yeah, I am aggress, I'm aggressively moving into extremely conservative positions right now. Um, and we'll see where things come out on the other, on the other side. But, uh, but as I said, for me to sit down and, you know, me totally retired, right. And to come back and all this stuff and to say, the economy is so uneasy. I'm going to, you know, add another 12 hours on top of my consulting. It just had to be done. But uh, so look at Vanessa. I went to Disney in 2017 and I loved it. It's a great time. Disney World in Orlando. Stood in Disney World parking lot in 85. So glad I went when I did. Took the family there. So, all right, everybody. I am going to sign out of here and uh, catch a little sleep. It's a day of consulting tomorrow. This show will be up. Thank you for sharing this. We have 1,258 subscribers to the Safety Doc Podcast, which is awesome. If you can... Um, can share it. Uh, I'd love this, the channel to grow. You know, obviously that would be great, but, uh, but yeah, please, please do that. So Bacon saying the reason capitalism isn't working is because uh, I allowed it to, because it would imagine everyone brainwashed and believing. Yeah. So you're right. Bacon, I think, I think you are right on this. Capitalism would work, right? There would be a way for things to products get made, things get delivered, services to be done. And that's being interfered with substantially at a government level. And the fact is like, I've never seen it like this before and never experienced it. So like if capitalism can't prevail, wow. Um, it's really alarming. Uh, Vanessa saying medical care is weighing heavily. My future trying to maintain funds for everything. Well, God bless you, Vanessa. You're an awesome person and wish you the best. And I've honestly been thinking about medical care 
also, um, just as in like how many hospitals stay um, solvent. And, you know, as I get older, right, um, or my family members who are older, you know, if they have to have some, you know, short or longer term medical care, what's available for them, you know, um, I started my career in long term care and medical and, uh, you know, years and years ago. So I, you know, but yeah, I, I also have those thoughts, you know, we live within two minutes of a brand new hospital which is, I guess, a good thing, but I'm trying to think, you know, and who's going to be trained. I read another story where this guy was, he and his wife decided they would only work with physicians who are 40 and older because they thought the younger physicians didn't have the same level of rigor required for their training and they weren't as competent. They're trying, you know, trying to learn on the job, not that they weren't good people. Right. But, you know, I, I knew a nurse practitioner who earned her nurse practitioner degree 100% online, 100% online. Wow. Actually, she was good. Probably the exception, but I'm like, that doesn't seem like that's the scenario. So, wow. This is our good friend, Mike McClude. Mike, thank you so much for the super sticker. That is, that means a lot to me. So thank you. You've also been a very good uh, supporter, regular supporter of the show. I appreciate that. Everyone for joining us at keep safe. Yeah. Keep on the greasy side down, shiny side up. That's a good point. Doc Sunflowers uh, is asking if she got, I didn't kick her out of the chat. No, I didn't. I didn't do anything for to sunflowers. So unless somebody else as a moderator did something, I did not. So sunflowers, no, I did not. So bacon, if you can share that with sunflowers, no, I did, did not do that. And there was nothing I saw. I appreciate sunflowers being in the chat. So I'm, Unless, you know, something happened here, but I, I, I did not, um, I've, I've actually not been doing any moderating during this show whatsoever. So, um, sorry about that sunflowers. So, all right. Okay, guys, I will, I will, uh, take us out here. Here we go. How were the beans and chili that you had for breakfast? They were delicious. Thank you for asking, but now I am very gassy. I'm sorry to hear that. (laughs) Who let the frogs out? Pew, that stinks very bad. I have to open the window. Oh no. My cap flew off and it was sucked into the engine. Holy smokes. The engine just cut out. We should use the decide model to help us make the right decision. Mayday. Mayday. I am declaring a beans and chili emergency. Please advise for landing. Flight 019er, two miles northeast, turn left at 90, maintain 4,800 to establish an approach. Chaos erupts. Torrents of conflicting yet urgent messages gush from media outlets. What is the magnitude of the incident? And what should people do to protect themselves? Dr. David P. Perodin teaches you how to prevent mental burnout by observing indicators and building a robust member check network. Reporter James David Dixon of the Detroit News proclaims, the velocity of information will empower its readers. Drawing on current events, history, interviews, and scholarship, the velocity of information is an education in the way people react and adapt to change in this fast-spinning world. Never has it been more important to sift facts and stories for truth and meaning. There are teachable moments on every page. Buy the Velocity of Information, Human Thinking During Chaotic Times. 
available from your favorite bookstore or online retailer. Describe the odor. Is it like when something electrical is burning? And so on. Ridiculous, right? If we don't shift the investigation to the reporter. But that's covertly what the school district thought needed to happen to prevent their investigation scrambling principles from burning out. And as this paragraph smolders, it would be prudent to consider bringing students with disabilities from the sidelines of safety and center them to active roles of detecting and reporting threats. So we had a rather difficult meeting. Upon due diligence of examining the reporting system, I informed the district representative that I could not justify modifications to the existing model as such changes would make the system less accessible to students. Well, that was a short chit chat. The district folks believed or hoped that the threat input system could be modified and maintained with fidelity. I wasn't in alignment with that hypothesis and so I was thanked and given notice that our partnership would be over at month's end. Business is business, but in school safety, it's never as simple as that. Holy shit, a ghost. Mm -hmm. um, do you mind moving out of the way? You're blocking the TV. Oh, shit. Sorry, man. It's okay. Thank you. <laughs>